Hey, what's going on? Hi, hi, how are you? Okay, so there's a, a lot to get to today, and I hope that you're okay wherever you are. The, uh, the thumbnail right off the top asking the question, are you strong enough? Are we strong enough? What is strength? There's a reason why this has been floating around my mind and in our mind here. Bob is going to join us in just a little bit. There's a, a lot of ground to cover when it comes to the idea of strength and vulnerability. Thanks for clicking the link. Get on your phone, by the way. Text your friends and tell them all to tune in. There we are. There we are. This is not even an official show or anything like that. We're just hanging out, trying to keep you company wherever you are around the world. So uh, it's nice to to uh, to be able to spend this time with you. I really appreciate all your comments uh, and your your thoughts over the past week since our last one. And uh, we just thought we'd just kind of hang out and do this. Okay, so the thumbnail. Are we strong? Are you vulnerable? What is strong? What is vulnerable? It is a, it's an interesting situation. I was, I was driving back to the house. I basically live in what looks like a, a haunted legion, a haunted veterans hall, if you will, a haunted chapel. I was uh, driving back in my El Camino and I was heading back. First of all, first of all, I was driving back in this El Camino. There's a picture of me in the Black Keys standing in front of it. So as I was heading back to the house, and I just need to be very clear about one thing, okay? I know how much gasoline my El Camino burns. I know the fossil fuel situation, but I chose to be vegan and I chose not to have kids so I could allow my sense a, ch a chance and an opportunity to drive a Chevy from the 1970s, okay? I did that on purpose. All right. So anyway, I drive me here and I was listening to a song. Uh, and I was listening to this song. And as I was listening to I was listening to uh, the James Gang. I don't know if you know the, the James Gang band, but listening to James Gang uh, in an uh, early 70s El Camino is quite a situation. It's quite a situation. And there's the song in particular I was listening to was called Ride the Wind, right? Not quite, not, not quite Thoreau, not quite Thoreau. Thoreau and Walden has a little bit more nature in his naturalness for sure. But there was a, by the way, Walden, Bob, I think, went to Walden. I'll, we'll talk about Bob. Just, actually, let's have a live look in on Bob right now. Bob is just... It's <laughs> amazing, by the way. That's a live look in on Bob. So um, Bob's actually been to Walden. But I was, I was sitting there and I was listening to Ride the Wind. And there was one lyric in particular in Ride the Wind that really, that really hit me. And, and because, because here's the thing. One of the things I'm fascinated with, and I've constructed a life where I can't necessarily have it as, as I'm completely fascinated by the concept of total freedom and absolute escapism, the kind of thing that Bob Sanger, Bob Seger sang about when he talked about being unencumbered by all the hustlers and their schemes. But but obviously I try to pick my spots. And in like like any good song, in what you think you're listening to it for, suddenly they hit you over the head with a whole other lyric. And so the lyric in question in the James Gang was, it's a great life if you don't weekend. It's a great life. If you try and be strong, turn your head and face the season, ride the wind before it's gone. It's a great life if you don't weekend. And I was not expecting when I was listening to the James Gang driving home to be hit by that. It's a great life if you don't weekend. And of course, if you're a Tragically Hip fan, you know that they actually have a song off uh, In Violet Light, which is an unbelievably beautiful record from the Tragically Hip, but they have a song called It's a Good Life If You Don't Weekend. So, James Gang, It's a Great Life If You Don't Weekend. Tragically Hip, It's a Good Life If You Don't Weekend. And I don't know if Gord Downey was pulling a Dickensian move with the jackal and the, you know, the wolf, the, or the, the, the chapter heading swap. But in that particular song, you might remember the lyric, which is epic. Oh, for a good life, we just might have to weekend. For a good life, we just might have to weekend. Can find somewhere to go. Remember that video? I was actually, when I worked at Much Music, I was on set for the making of that video. Um, but this idea, this idea for a good life, do you have to weaken? And that's kind of what I want to explore today. That's what Bob and I want to bring. And actually, let's bring in Bob uh, right now so you can say hi to him. Hey, buddy, how are you? I'm good, pal. So... All right, then. We're, we're getting right into the nitty-gritty. We're getting a nitty-gritty. Oh, first of all, it's now time to break the fast. It's 7.08. Um, but yeah, so listen, I want to bring in a very special guest today who is um, really doing something interesting with vulnerability, right? And that's, but you know, but this is, whenever we, we put a thumbnail, we want people to watch and hang out with us. We're always going to change up, you know, because it's your and my brain. We're going to wander. We're going to do lots of things. But that's, but this is the thread that I think is going to work through this one about to be weak, to be vulnerable, to be strong. What do what does any of that mean in the first place? 
I don't love the word vulnerability. I don't hate it, mm -hmm. but I don't love it because I think it implies a certain amount of you're leaving yourself. There's, there's danger and you're making yourself available to that danger vulnerability. Yeah. I kind of prefer the word openness. I like openness mm -hmm. because openness applies implies that there's a vulnerability there and that, you know, like if you ever watched, I laugh when I rub my dog on the belly and you know, she lies upside down. I'm thinking this dog is not scared. No, like she, not at all. Not she, at has all. No, she has no fear in this situation. That dog <laughs> is very vulnerable. Yeah. But what I like about the word, uh, uh, openness is it also implies, uh, a kind of a positive moving forward. Uh, the ability to make connections and stuff. And I think we want that in our vulnerability, but I feel like it's maybe just vulnerability plus openness, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Why did you get so into this topic today? Like it hit you, but you know, you listen to lots of music. What, what hit you about it? Let's let me play junior psychologist here. Well, you know, because I think I wasn't expecting it. I was driving, I had a lot on my mind as one does. And I just wanted to check out, I wanted to check out in a, dazed and confused kind of Richard Linklater way. And I have this beat up old car that's been keyed multiple times by people in states of various states of crisis in their life on the street. So my car is, is not a show car. My car is a beat up driver, daily driver. And I, you know, lots going on. So I just wanted to clear my brain. And I was running some errands and I put, I'm like, what do I, what can I listen to that isn't going to take me elsewhere? Grateful Dead would make me think about Burning Man that I got planning to do. You know, if I put on Slayer, it would just fuel the rage in me. If I put on the Beastie Boys, it would be like, oh, what was it like when I was 16? I thought, you know, it's an easy fix. James Gang. I'm going to put on the James Gang. I'm not even going to put on the early James Gang with the great Joe Walsh. And you know how much I love Joe Walsh. I'm not even going to put on early uh, James Gang. I'm just going to put on the James Gang and I'm just going to, check out, man. And then I'm listening to this song. And I think the second or third song was Ride the Wind. And I was like, oh yeah, freedom, escapism. Yeah, this is exactly what I want. And then for a good, for a great life, you have to, don't weaken, be strong. And I went, oh, for crying out loud, this is not what I wanted to get into today. You know, James Gang is one of those bands where when you like them, it's like you have a, a belt buckle that's also a beer bottle opener. Yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. And that's what got me into it, right? That's what got me into it. I was just trying to explore it and this idea of, but I want to talk more about openness and I hope people are starting to sign on now. Thank you for this. It's nice to see you all pop here. Um, and, Can we come uh, back to openness in a, for a second? Can we come yeah, back yeah, to openness? Yeah, yeah, yeah because I need more on that. Yeah, because you, you threw out a really interesting idea of, you know, what's the value of strength and do we need yeah. to weaken? Can you bring up that Gord Downey image again with the, with the lyric? I'm bringing it right here. Yeah, there it is. All right. Oh, for a good life, we just might have to weaken. Strength is a, in a very, it's a very funny word to use these days because I feel like it has weird negative associations that when you describe something as strong, especially like male strength, mm -hmm. there's a sense that there's a toxicity that's attached to it. But I feel like that's because strength in a very particular context is the is seen similarly to power mm -hmm. and power is seen similarly to abuses of power. Mm -hmm. So I almost feel like, you know, whether it's uh, financial strength or cultural strength, we have a tendency to admire it, but also fear it because we think it's going to come back on us mm -hmm. from somebody else going back to the, my dog upside down again, we're kind of yeah. like, we live our lives like my upside down dog. But I think that being strong is always good. And we have to take out the negative associations with that word. Ooh, Pow. Yeah, this is, yeah. 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 I, I feel like it's always good to be strong. It's actually never good to be weak in the same way that it's always good to be healthy and it's never good to be infirm. I was being interviewed today uh, by a very nice man, uh, Claudio, who is on Master Chef Canada, chef, and it's for a magazine. And when, whenever that comes out, I'll tell you about it to, to, to you. And you can check it out if you're so inclined. But one thing he was talking to me was about self-made and strong. And I obviously don't you know, connect to self-made at all. I don't think many people are. But then I had a moment where I stopped and I thought, God, you know, the closest person I know to being a self-made person is my mom. Mm -hmm. And... and even though I understand that my mom was, my family played a big role for sure. But if, if anybody had been thrown overboard by the system a long time ago, it was not just my mom, but it was people like that, you know, single parents, particularly, especially if you're below the poverty line, you're broke. And I was just thinking, my God, my mother was so strong. She was also tender. She was tender, but she was strong. 
And I thought, I, there is nothing toxic or bad about that. Well, although maybe she would tell me. To, now, for her, she thinks she didn't do it alone. She thought that the Lord helped her get through it. And, you know, and, and if you believe it to be true, then it is true. But she was so strong. And I thought, there is nothing wrong with that kind of strength. It is a shame that she needed to be that strong. But she had no choice. We live in a pretty patriarchal society. And so strength tends to be defined by a very certain set of terms and uh for good and bad yeah and you know i think we we reckoned with a lot of the bad recently and that's been a very healthy process but in some ways wanting self-control has be become almost kind of weirdly negative i yeah. feel like strength just needs a different definition like if i were to say to you is rest the opposite of strength when you work out you would say no rest is what enables you to get stronger right but right. rest right. Like, you know, so that's, there's, there's lay down your arms a little bit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's not always aggressive. It's not always pushing forward. The ability to uh, look for the agency of others is a form of strength. The ability to not speak, yeah, even though you have something to say, because it might not be the wisest thing to do as a form of strength. Like these things have to be dictated by situation. So, um, to almost like declaw it, to take the power out of it and to actually look at it as a contextual thing, I think would be a healthy process. You probably didn't know I was about to do this next, but when you say declaw, it actually works out perfectly. And we, we talk about strength and vulnerability. And I talked about, you know, how I felt my mother was and, and the way you're thinking about this as well is that there's so much power that is required to be out there and fight on behalf of the vulnerable and the voiceless. And that sometimes that's people, sometimes that's animals, it's all kinds of things. And there's all, so I want to, Bob, I want to, I want to show you something here. I want to introduce you to somebody who I think is fascinating. Uh, he is, first of all, this is him. He's all right. The trap King. And I love the fact that this picture of the trap King is on a, an Instagram called show your soft side. He's the trap King. This is the trap King holding a cat. I think that cat's only got one eye which I think is so beautiful. And here's another picture of the Trap King that, uh, that, that this was posted about the Trap King that I love so much. So the Trap King is this guy called Sterling Davis, uh, artist, rapper, uh, I believe, and he was about to go on the road at one point um, with a, on, 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 a, on a pretty meaningful tour, but decided to do something else. And that thing was about using his strength and his vulnerability to kind of get into, just to get into another way to care about people. And I just, I'm very, very excited uh, to bring him on right now because he's, he's joining us. Um, hello, sir. How are you today? Oh, I can't even hear you. I, th I think, are you muted there? Hold on one sec. There you are. Now I can hear you. You there? Hey, how you doing? Can you hear me? I'm, I'm very beautifully. Very well. Um, it is so nice uh, to, to meet you, actually, to be in this situation uh, with you because obviously uh, you don't know me, but on this show, one thing that we love... Uh, we love animals and we love kindness and we love tenderness and we love different ways of exploring masculinity and we love different ways, especially because we're pretty edgy people and we found that most of the people online who talk about what a man should be, they talk about lions. I think, yeah, lions are great, but kittens are rad too. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> There's all kinds of ways. So you, you're not a trap. I mean, trap king, could be, like I've interviewed people who are trap artists as rappers, uh, but you're a trapper, man. You're a yeah. trapper, right? Can you tell people what it is that you do? <laughs> so I run a nonprofit. My nonprofit is called Trap King Humane Cat Solutions. That's why I'm Trap King. And I do TNR. So that's Trap, Neuter, and Return. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, a humane alternative for death and euthanasia for stray and feral cat populations. Right. Yeah. I want to get into details about that, but I want to, to, to open it by talking about the subject that we've kind of been thinking about throughout the course of the night, which is for a good life, you have to weaken for a good life. You can't weaken. And it's this really strange relationship we, we have with being tough, with being all that. Can you walk me through your experience with this? Oh man, it's, it's been a, it's been wild for most of my life. So, I mean, mm -hmm. being little, a young, a young man, even my uncles was like, why don't you get a dog, man? Why don't you like dogs? And so, so there's so many stereotypes around what a, man is supposed to do and how he's supposed to be. I, I paint my nails. I get a lot of slack about paint my nails and rescuing cats. And a lot of what I do has a, a lot to do with letting people know that, you know, if you're a man, you could still be compassionate. You could still 
play with cats. You could still adopt cats, help cats. You, you, you know, it's not a, we put these gender roles on so many things and I think it hurts us and, and lessens our experiences in life sometimes. And, you know, there, what I like about what you're doing is that it's multifold, right? If you think about it, and I'm sure you have thought about it, it's, it's not, you're, you're working with not just what a man should do with a cat and different ways you could be it, but also breaking down the rescue communities biases and bridging the gap between all of that. Cause there is an awful lot of, there are an awful lot of reasons why what you're doing is really important. Saving the cats is probably at the top, but everything else, right. Is, is about how much can we find common ground with each other and bridge a lot of these gaps. And I think that must've been, I, I, was that always the intention? Yeah, that was always the attention because a lot of I've always felt like and I come from music. I've always felt like things like music, comedy, animals, you know, they could bring people together. So it's not only am I helping the animals, but it is bridging the gap between communities of color, underserved communities of color with the rescue community. And the, the cat rescue community is predominantly uh, middle aged women. So you don't really see a lot of men. You don't see a lot of people of color. So it's bridging the gap. It's bringing us together in a lot of ways. I mean, I've had friends now in the rescue world that I probably would have never had. And we mm -hmm. go out and rescue cats, go get our nails done. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's cool. So it's another way to bring people together and uh, open people up to something new. Because a lot of people have no idea what TNR or cat rescue is. Well, for you cats, when you were a kid, because you had a pretty rough um, situation at home, right? Cats were kind of a savior for you. Yeah, growing up in an abusive household, man, it was probably, and that's where the being a voice for the voiceless come from, because I can remember feeling like as a kid, I didn't have an outlet or I didn't have somebody that would speak up for me in my situation. I, you know, this man that was in the house with me and my mother, he was very abusive and I felt like I was stuck. So a lot of times where the cats came in at for me is I was outside playing with the stray cats because I didn't want to go in the house. I didn't want to go. Home. It was like bad at home. But I'm like, I'm going to stay out here, mess with these cats. Mm -hmm. And I'm you know, I'm sitting out here talking with some more voiceless uh, beings that probably feel the same way. So that was that really connected me to cats there. I could feel that because I felt like I was in their shoes. Yeah. What did you learn about yourself, though, as you went through this process <laughs> as from com becoming uh my start my nonprofit and trap yeah, king yeah man you know as far what i learned about with me is i am definitely uh a different guy a out the box thinker <laughs> found out that i was way more uh determined i was looking at a clip of you of yours when you were saying uh talking about when you started and mm -hmm. if you want really bad and i learned that about me i wanted it i mean i my both of my friends i remember telling my friends that i'll i'll live under a bridge before i do something again that i don't want to do like i want to love what i do i wanted to have meaning in life and you know i'm gonna go for broke i'm gonna bet on myself i'm gonna go for broke i'm not i'm not gonna stop so i've li i lived out of my conversion van for <laughs> a year to, to be it. Cause I couldn't afford cat surgeries and rent. So, right. oh, man. <laughs> so you made a choice, you made a choice for cat <laughs> surgeries over rent. I made a choice. <laughs> it wasn't, let me tell, let me tell you, it wasn't, pro, it, it wasn't the most popular move at first. A bunch of my friends was like, man, we were going to do an intervention. We were about to <laughs> do an intervention on people. <laughs> like struggling is leaving a rap tour. <laughs> to go be broke, like to Dude, volunteer. You were, you, were, you were about to go on the road with Tech Nine, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, that would have been unbelievable. <laughs> right. <laughs> but you and know, I think for I, context, too, were you also in the Navy, weren't you? Yes. Yeah. 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 So you've you you like you've done some stuff. You've been around. An opportunity as an artist to go on the road with Tech Nine and have a great tour is one thing, but something inside of you must have been, you know, clawing away at you to use the phrase. Man, yeah, right. It was, I, you know. I just, I didn't know. I always had cats. I always love cats. I'm vegan. I always, I love all animals. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's not a diet healthy thing. It's literally for my love of animals. So I've always had that in me to live a life of service from the military, uh, helping animals. I've always wanted to do that. So it was something that, 
it felt like it was just what I needed to do. What, what mm -hmm. it, it felt like the next step. I was, I can remember thinking, I really want to have an impact, a positive impact in a way, not just standing, you know, looking cool on stage performing. Although I love music, I still do some music. I actually do cat raps now. So, <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> So one of the things that I learned uh, that helps me spread the word and get more people, different demographics engaged in Cat Rescue is I decided to rap about it. So I have a few songs. Uh, one of my songs, Chase and Tail, is hilarious. It's about catching and rescuing cats, but it's funny because it's Chase and Tail. So uh -huh. I don't, you know, I'm not cursing in my songs or anything anymore. So it's, it's giving me an opportunity to be able to perform in front of uh people and just a different outlook a different approach to cat rescue i've gone to some schools and mm -hmm. rap for some kids and it was like it was cool they they responded to it differently probably than me just standing there saying hey you for know sure. you should have cats <laughs> for sure i grew up in toronto you grew up a few hours down the road you're in detroit right detroit was home. yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I, have, um, I have cousins from canada oh yeah what neighborhood do you know where where uh ontario yeah yeah, yeah. that's it yeah. right over the border do you, now, do you still live in Atlanta? I'm kind of everywhere now. Yeah. I've I was able to upgrade out of the uh, conversion van. I live in an RV now, so Amazing. I'm kind of all over the place. I I'm I'm still in Atlanta a lot, but a lot of my work now leads me to rescuing in different cities, states, countries. I'm you, I mean, actually I, headed to you, Ohio. You've been at CatCon. You're heading to Ohio. You're for an event. Like you go to these events, you're doing a lot of public speaking ab about this, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. A lot of my public speaking is dealing with TNR, educating assist on it, helping people get started, um, just helping people skip some of the not necessarily skip, but not go through some of the things that I had to go through, mm -hmm. um, understanding, running a nonprofit and getting started in rescue. Could you have ever imagined that this is where your life was going to go? Never, never, <laughs> never. If you would have told me. When I, I was, you know, I was typical young. When I was young, I was like, I'm going to rap or play basketball. And then it's crazy because you get to a point where you're rapping mm -hmm. and I'm about to go forward with Tech 9 and then epiphany. It's like something that it's like, I think I know what I'm supposed to do. It wasn't even a thing. I knew exactly I'm supposed to do this, which is, that was crazy. <laughs> you know, you talk about how it's not a path that men would often take and but often we find somebody who does a thing and then very quietly others will come on and start asking questions and leaning into their more compassionate or their more vulnerable or their, those sides of them. I'm assuming you've had some kind of interactions like that. Oh man, a ton of them, which are, is, some of them are hilarious because I'll do a presentation. I had one uh, recently where I was doing a presentation, uh, about dealing with feral humans, you know, humans that are kind of <laughs> yeah. humans that are kind of upset that you're coming to work with the cats. And after the after I spoke, a guy came to me and he whispered, he leaned in and whispered to me, was like, hey, I like cats, too. I got about three of them. And I was like, hey, man, why are you whispering? It's OK. <laughs> <laughs> It's okay. Your your masculinity isn't going to drop off because you rescue cats. Like it's, it's it's okay that you have cats. It's, it's like you can speak up and say that. Be proud of it. There are so many ways. Uh, I I I think that the whole point of masculinity and strength, which we have biologically, is to use it to protect as opposed to to take. Yeah, and yeah. I and I think yeah, and protecting the vulnerable, the voiceless, like kitties, is amazing. I, I agree. I feel like it takes a strong person to 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 follow their heart, be honest, be true to themselves and take a path not usually taken. Like I said, for me, it was, it's definitely not what anybody would have expected me to do. I still even my mother tells me that to this day. She's like, Sterling, I can't believe this is your life, but I'm proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, it was probably very interesting for her knowing the the genesis of this for you and your love for cats. Cause she was yeah. going through it. She was going through the trauma as you were as well. Yeah. Yeah, she was. And she did, you know, a lot of it, she didn't really even know un or understand the bond with, with cats, but she understood why I didn't want to come home too early yeah. most days. So 
yeah she was she was really happy about it but she didn't know at first growing up that that's what i was that that's how the bond was created she was just like i know he's trying to stay out the house by all means because it was bad at home yeah the for people to help you because it costs money for these cat surgeries how can they do that um i have uh trap king uh humane cat solutions uh paypal uh if you go to trapkinghumane.org the website it'll take you to places to donate but also outside of just the funds i mean spreading the word spreading the word and then the the woman that you see up the street with all the cats mm -hmm. you know help her out she's not some crazy lady she's not mm -hmm. doing something bad she's probably spending all her money including mm -hmm. her social security check to feed these cats and get them fixed and help so she's not that woman up the street with all the cats isn't bad there's a, there's a cemetery not too far from here um just down the road and for for years people would take their cats when they just wanted to get rid of them and they would just drop them off at the cemetery and a whole bunch of people have gone now and built little cat houses and you can see on the weekends people going by feeding them so there's this really lovely community in the hollywood forever cemetery it's where you know johnny ramone and Dee Dee ramone and chris cornell are buried it's that spot right and yeah, and there's this I, one I, section wow that is that is cool and see that's what i mean that's the life right there that's something mm -hmm. like the cats and rescue bringing people together at a you know people probably go in there feeding i mean i know so many people that do that and that's their life like that's what they do they look forward to that do you have an estimate of how many cats you've helped or worked with or been a part of their lives oh i have to be i i would say i'm over ten thousand now i'm in i'm definitely in the upper high wow. thousands because i've i've been doing it so long and when i first started i actually worked for the county in atlanta mm -hmm. And so they gave me a vehicle, a bunch of traps, and I, you know, I have bad insomnia. So I would just be up all night. It would be nothing for me to get like 30 cats in a night and bring them in to get fixed. And then I did, we, I went to Greece and I think we did like two, over 200 cats in two days. In Greece? So I, yeah, I went to Greece. They have a serious cat problem out there and they were trying to get people to understand TNR and get people engaged into it. So I went out there and worked with a lot of people trapped a lot of cats was able to crown a trap king and trap queen of greece <laughs> nice. Nice. um what do you i know i i don't know if i got the name of the cat right mr mr, mr. patches or something but when you lose cats and you have such a bond with them I, I just on a human level how do you being in the lives of so many animals is something losing them is so traumatic how have you been yeah. around that that's that's the tough part that that's the the toughest part of rescue is probably the compassion fatigue and burnout that comes with it and that's one of the things losing a cat uh the cats that you can't uh save you can't fix like and most people in rescue know this you'll beat yourself up on it about mm -hmm. it forever because mm -hmm. you really want to help each and every one of them but losing the cat is something that it's something that always hurts it never hurts but one thing that i was i learned early on with one of the women that that was teaching me TNR, is she she would say because I would boo hoo really bad like I'm talking like sniffing like your mom spanked you when you little just uh, 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 just cry and they would always tell me Sterling it, you gotta calm down a little bit but mm -hmm. it's you you're supposed to cry the day that you don't have that feeling and emotion is the day you probably should stop doing this right so that's it you know it keep it keeps me human you gotta have a, a, a silver line into it and I try, I try to understand that it keeps me human. I think about the ones that I can't help, but it's losing the cat. It's always tough. It's never, it's never something that's, that's easy. And I, and that's another thing that I try to do too, is, you know, bring, inject some fun and some happiness into it because it can be a tough job. And a lot of people that do rescue suffer from uh, burnout and compassion fatigue. Oh, for sure. Um, you're, where are you parked now? And do you have cats in the, in the RV with you? Like, are you traveling with cats? Oh yeah, my babies always come with me. Uh, right now, I have two of them with me: Nipsey yeah. Cuddle and Alanis Muissette. <laughs> so MC Cuddle and Alanis Muissette. <laughs> I've, all my cats are are all my cats come from music to some extent of some of my favorite artists. So I've had a Rick James. I have Alanis Muissette. Mm -hmm. I have Demita Joe, which is Janet Jackson's middle name. Yeah, so that's right. Uh, 
Right. To me, the joke. Put, my, I remember those teachers put me on a planet, damn it, where all the girls look like Janet. And it was Danny yeah. that was written on the bottom of that shirt. I remember that yeah. so greatly. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's amazing, right? Uh, trauma, fear leads to openness, which is something Bob mentioned off the top of us gathering today, and openness and vulnerability. And you're able to build this, a life that is so unique and seemingly so free. Yeah, it's like I said, I would have never assumed that I would be doing this. I would I never assumed I would be living out of a vehicle, basically, but yeah. I love it. I love I really love what I do. And I and that's something that I think um, you know, with anything. If you love it, you can do it forever. You could do it at a at a mm -hmm. at a serious rate, a high rate. So I love it, man. I I really love what I do. But it is crazy. I never thought this would be life. <laughs> Before I let you split, what and I appreciate your time. I know it's later where you are. The what what's the what, what do you want to do with this? What's the next step of this? The next step is uh because I, I know I won't be able to do it forever. The next thing that I'm I really want to do is create a fraternity sorority type deal based on cat rescue. So if you when you think about it, when people graduate from college, they still volunteer and donate to the mm -hmm. their fraternity and sorority. So I want to create, I want to transition that type of thing to cat rescue to where it's, it's like a, so much of a fun thing, like a club. So because I have sponsors, I have cat food sponsors, cat trap uh, sponsors, people that don't necessarily have the means to start their nonprofit, they can join the trap king, trap queen fraternity sorority, and they could basically outsource my, what I have. They'll like through participating vet clinics, they'll be able to go get food, get traps and take and have their surgeries take care of taken care of by yeah. using my connections. That would be the most popular uh, sorority and fraternity on any campus. If you did that, what would you call it? Like feline swat -a Like what's the Greek name? You could bring, <laughs> you could bring the two. I was thinking. Think about something with cloud or in it or something. I don't know. <laughs> Trap King Humane Cat Solutions. Uh, people got to find you online. And we'll, we'll put it in the description as well. Uh, and we'll share this on our social. Just, hey, dude, I know it's last minute, but really grateful that you came on and shared your story and talked a bit about this. Thank you. You actually, like I said, you made my day when you all reached out. So it was, I mean, thank you. Thanks a lot for having me. Like I say, anytime to spread the word about what I do, mm -hmm. how much I love it, how good it is. I'm here. I'm here for it. So thank you. If you ever drive that RV to Los Angeles or to Toronto, hit me up because and bring the cats in the house. I want to meet them. We we need to get we need to get Alanis Morissette to meet Alanis Muissette. That's what we need to get to happen. You gonna see me fan guy crazy? I know every song off Jagged Little Pill. I will lose it. <laughs> okay, well, well, we'll clip this. We'll put it on Instagram story. Everybody share it. Everybody share it with Alanis. Maybe she'll see it. Sterling Davis, the Trap King. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, brother. Appreciate you. <laughs> Appreciate you. Oh, I love that. I, I love what he does. And I love his approach to, to being open and being vulnerable and where he came from. Uh, Bob, you know, I love dogs, but I respect the hell out of cats way more. I, res I love dogs. I'm a dog, but I respect cats. Before we get into how neat that guy is, yeah. uh, I'm so disappointed in you. What do you mean? You were looking for the name for a feline uh, yeah, fraternity, yeah, yeah. and you didn't think of you didn't think of Phi Beta Cata. Well, no, I said feline swat a cata, because a cat's got a swat. I was trying to be clever. Didn't work. <laughs> yeah. But, okay. Well, anyway, I was. Trying, what, I love this. This world is so neat. This world is just filled with interesting people who are doing cool things and. Yeah. The second you allow yourself the permission to be anything, uh, wow, how many could, doors open up for you just for neat experiences? If the James gang were going to throw me into an existential moment where do you have to have a, do you have to not weaken to have a great life? The whole point of me listening to that was about freedom and escapism and freedom and just being anything you want is, as you said, it's kind of, it's unbelievable. And there were lots of comments were coming in. I didn't, I couldn't add any comments because I was, I was trying to pay attention to Sterling. Let's bring in Nathan. Nathan, hi, how are you? All right, Nathan, you're I'm in- I'm uh, very good. How are you doing? Saw, you're in Toronto? Or no, I am in DC and the cherry blossoms are blooming. So yeah, I'm happy. I'm not, I'm not at Trinity Bellwoods huddled around the six that are there. So this is where you see them in danger. Bob's in Toronto, Nathan's in BC. What were the comments like? What were people saying? 
people were so happy with Sterling, but there were also a lot of comments um, going back to your mom when talking about vulnerability. Someone said that um, they remember you telling a story about her getting a TV from the street for you or something like that. Oh, dude, we didn't have a, we didn't have it. Yeah. The only TVs we had up until I moved out when I was, you know, older to start my life, uh, were TVs found in the garbage and my mother would put the garbage, the TV, because back then everybody, you know, richer people would throw TVs out, but they were the kind of TVs and only certain kinds of certain era of people will know what this is like, where the handles were broken. So you'd have to have vice grip pliers on the channel changer. And so you'd have to change the channel manually with a vice grip because the handle was broken or the, the the dial was broken and she would leave it in the closet and we were not allowed to watch tv until friday nights but here's the thing my mom was always freaked out by cats because she thought cats were but she loved them because for whatever reason somebody will probably have an idea stray cats used to follow me home and stay with me they probably spotted a sucker so i've had many many a stray cat in my life and my mom started to, I would watch her when I was a teenager, fall in love with these kittens that I would bring home because they were so strange. They were so strange. But yeah, that was my mom. My mom, and Luann, by the way, just put that comment up that a rescue's name is George. So I don't think it's named after me, but I'm going to take it, Lou. I'm going to take that one. <laughs> oh, Luann also yeah, says, yeah. hi, Nathan. <laughs> Hello, Luann. How are you doing? But yeah, back to the Trap King. Oh, what a guy. Loved him. Um, the... Andrew says the entire vulnerable conversation is something more people should adopt. Just because you have a heart doesn't mean you're less of what society thinks a man is. And Linda said, people just need to be authentic. Just be who you want to be. Find your passion, enjoy, and yes, paint your nails. Paint your nails. I don't, Bob, I think, Bob, when we were on the radio together in the early days, you would paint your nails. I would. I would. Yeah. And, uh, wear, and wear women's clothing sometimes. But it was 1994 and I was in a rock band and, you know, yeah, it's just what you did. <laughs> it's what you did. Um, so, yeah, some of the comments have been really amazing. Uh, you know, before we go, like, I, it's Earth Day is coming up. We want to do Earth Day stuff. We just want to hang out. Uh, but Bob and I really want to talk about this vulnerability thing and how we feel about stuff. Uh, and so we thought we would kind of lean into it. I love how it's kind of all uh, coming together which is kind of nice. But there were also comments we've got over the last couple of weeks. I still love the fact that people think you look like Jay Maskus from Dinosaur Jr. That that comment, for whatever reason, brings me <laughs> an awful lot of joy. We got other, other responses, other mail we got coming in? We did, yeah. Well, last week we had tons of comments flood in from our interview with David Mosscrop. Mm -hmm. Lenora said, I've got avocados at home is the new pickup line. I don't know how you feel about that, but that would definitely Ooh. make <laughs> wait i've got avocados as home is that the way of saying that i have i have heat in my property is that what that means like what does that mean i i, I can afford I mean, avocados <laughs> well you can get a, you can get a discounted bag of avocados in chinatown for like three bucks so if you're at loblaws spending three dollars for an avocado then maybe that is a litmus test that you can pay your rent but uh, that, um, is not, that is not a catchphrase i ever want to use on somebody or have used on me <laughs> And there are a lot of people, Greg is very unhappy with the libs and not carrying out their promise for electoral reform. Well, this goes back to our to topic last week, right, about it, yeah. It's, you know, it's funny, by not being funny at all, that electoral reform thing, even though it was on the first election, is something that has haunted them for a long time. And I think it's a big reason why they couldn't take the next step. I think that and indigenous issues were a big problem for them in, in this liberal party in particular, uh, even though, because they came in with such promise and such, you know, sunny days. But it's funny how that thing still haunts them. I think that still thing still, still haunts them. I just saw that film Civil War, by the way, the uh, the new um, Civil War movie. I, I, let's talk about it next week because I want, Bob, I need you to see this film so we can talk about this. And I want, if, you, if you're listening to this right now, um, you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook or LinkedIn or wherever you may be, you uh, watch it because it's pretty, it's a pretty gnarly, gnarly story, but there's a Canadian joke in there about the economy that is stunning and got a laugh from six people in the movie theater who all happen to be Canadian. So we'll get into that uh, in the coming weeks, but that definitely, oh, Paul Meehan is saying avocados and chili. Well, avocados and chill. Oh my God. That's a whole other thing. Paul, I'm okay with that. Actually, that, that to me sounds like a reasonable thing here. Um, Luann wants to know if we're going to talk about the budget in the kilometer thermometer. Bob and I are not necessarily, you know, economic experts, um, but 
I, I'm sure it'll come up at some point. I think it'll come one point. Let me look here. I, I don't feel. I, I don't feel like I'm ruining the surprise by saying, "Yeah, yeah we will come up to that." Yeah. Oh, yeah, Andrew right. says that he got a TV out of the trash as a kid too. I certainly made up for it, by the way, when I moved into a place and got a TV and got cable. But I didn't have cable. I think I think until I started working. Maybe I was 26 years old, maybe with 25 was the first time I got cable in my life. So I didn't see it. All right, Nathan, thank you. If there's more stuff that pops on, more comments, just holler and join us. You know, why not? We'd like to get the comments. That'd be really fun. fun. That's a big part in someone's life when you buy your first appliance. Because it's one thing to get in a a place, maybe you're sharing it with people, or if you're lucky, you're on your own, if that's your thing. But the first time, like it's one of those threshold moments into adulthood when you buy your first appliance toaster blender mm-hmm. you know i think for us my wife and i we got a tv and it was in the days before the flat screens so it was enormous it was so heavy it had to weigh 200 pounds it was no joke it took up about two-thirds of the room we were so proud of it because we had a tv and it was by sony but we named it sunny right <laughs> it was like Fair. our first i sunny. i was- Remember when I when I lived on Claremont by Tironi in Toronto, and I had I had wanted for a long time to buy one of these new plasma TVs, and so I bought one. I was working at Much Music. I wasn't making a lot of Much Music, but I was I was making enough that I was like, you know what, I'm going to buy this TV. But I put it in my bedroom at the foot of my bed, and I remember I was there's this there's this girl, this woman that I was really into, and you know she had come over and whatever. At one point, put the TV on, and it was when the plasma, the display screen was like a wheat field, was the image. And I remember looking at the horror in her face. It was as if, it was as if there was a mushroom cloud and a nuclear explosion of radiation and brightness. The TV was so mental. That's when I thought, God, that that's that's something a boy would have wanted. That TV in the bedroom. I need to move this out of the bedroom. <laughs> It is your, not good. First, your, first, your first real TV is a big moment. You know what else I was thinking is a real threshold moment too? Mm-hmm. The first time you buy a spice that isn't salt or pepper. Oh, you mean? Oh, you, well, I think that's. I think every well, ethnicity has their own version of it. Cinnamon or cardamom or like because you intend and this is like cooking, like you intend to make a dish that requires more than salt and pepper. Right. Paul's I, had the vice grip charger on the nineteen inch black. I love it. I love that so much. I can still. I still have. PTSD, Paul and Bob, about a, the smell of a burning tube behind an old television <laughs> that kind of designed, that sort of defined the smell of my childhood. Somebody else can relate to this. Grown up things. Absolutely, it's grown up things. Bob, I want to play you a video because I, you know, I've lost a million hours of my life to to reaction videos. And I've got an epic reaction video to play for you. But I just wanted to check in with you, first of all. You're training for triathlon. I want to know how your health journey is going. And because, again, being vulnerable and being open, how are you feeling? Like uh, I'm not doing a good job of it, but. (laughs) Okay, pre-COVID, I was really training hard. Yeah. And was in great shape, and I wanted to do the Olympic triathlon. I'd done ones in the past, and I was really excited about it. And then COVID just completely derailed everything. So now I'm getting back to it. And uh, I have a strategy, though, because I'm not like fit right now (laughs) but you can't really fake fit in when you're doing a triathlon (laughs) you can't really talk your way out of 10 kilometers when i got during the pen just at one point with the pandemic i snuck home and i saw you and you were in really good shape you were in really really good shape i was working out really hard and really enjoying it and you get into a lovely rhythm anyone who runs or lifts weights or whatever you know how it is when you get to that point where you actually you miss it if you don't do it totally there uh even bravo even if i just sign up well here's my strategy and still uh, see if you still feel that way karen uh i'm gonna lie about my age what are you gonna say you're like 60 yeah i'm gonna say i'm 60 so that i can crush those bastards (laughs) i figure i figure with my gray hair people may just go wow that guy looks great for 60. So you're gonna lie oh, about your yeah. age. You're yeah, gonna lie about your age. Yeah, I'm gonna be like one of those little league pitcher kids who's like, you know, pitches when you think he's 12 and you find out later he's 35 and he's got a family. He's a pipe fitter. <laughs> Here's what Daniel says. I thought I trained enough a few years back, but it was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Uh, I don't have the knees to run at all, but even before I wrecked my knees in motorcycle accidents, I didn't have the knees to run. And Daniel's right. It looks like one of the worst things you can train for. 
Okay, so real talk, we were talking about strength and and how, you know, a good life if you don't weaken. Yeah. Not to be glib about it, but I think there are two things that get people through. Fitness right. and purpose. Fitness means mental, spiritual, and physical. And purpose is really just when you wake up in the morning to feel like what you're doing counts. And that can mean anything. It can mean you have a career that you love. It can mean that you want your family to do well. Mm -hmm. It can mean that you just really want to experience neat things and you're going to put yourself in a position to do that. A sense of purpose is everything. But the other thing is fitness. And I'm going to real talk here for a second, yeah. George. Yeah. Now, anybody who knows my story knows that I've been up and down with anxiety since I was 19 years old. And I've had all kinds of treatments and all kinds of experiences. And I'm not saying that medicine doesn't work. I'm actually a huge advocate for it because there's a thresh threshold past which it is very hard to do things without assistance. Yeah. But, but that said, fitness, I feel like nobody told us nearly enough how much it could fix. I feel like nobody nearly told us enough how much easier it was to be a healthy, decent, happy human being if you're not fighting how you feel all the time. I, you know, you and I are both from this sort of, and, and you and I both kind of walk a fine line of it because we both have some of those old school Gen X immigrant toxic traits that we don't even think are that toxic, right? We both, but we also understand the positivity of where it needs to go. So I, I think that you and I are, are very much like a lot of people out there who, who sit there and think that, you know, how we were, how we were raised, there, there was a lot of value in how we were raised and how tough it was for us. Yep. But I, I agree with you hundred percent in that sports and athletics when we were kids was so heavily based on competition. And if you didn't have that first step, your relationship with fitness was so different. We ended up smoking by the portables or asking some guy, we'll give you five bucks if you get us a case of beer at the beer store at the Brewers Retail when we were 13 or 14 years old because there was those guys who played sports and who were athletic and then there were us and there was no bridge behind it. And it just took me in the last seven, eight years of my life and I'm in my 50s now, last seven, eight years of my life, Bob, to try to figure out, can I get healthy in my brain after all my concussions by being physically fit? And I, I didn't, I never connected to it until now. Your body knows what to do. Yeah. It knows what to do, but there are blockages that happen and ways that it breaks down and these things manifest in all kinds of ways, you know, diet, exercise, you know, if I had like, I'm not an expert, mm -hmm. I, I'm going to, I'm going to put names and dates to stuff that for me are just approximations. But if I were king of the world, school would be half play outside for half the day until kids go to grade seven mm -hmm. because mammals learn through play. And more importantly, what do you think is more important that your kid really freaking drills down on his times tables or her times tables, right. or like let their neurons wire properly, let their bodies develop properly, run around, get fresh air, have fun. And they'll learn socialization through play faster than sitting at a desk and showing that they can be quiet and pretend they have a job. Wait, does that mean that you don't make your daughter do homework? Every day, damn it. What world do you live in? <laughs> I, listen, so you, much homework. You know, like I said, to, I said to my <laughs> wife today, I said, you know, I can't yell at her for wanting to read and not do the supplementary work I gave to her. <laughs> Here's a nice quote from Andrew. If you've gone through it and found out how to beat it, I'd call you an expert. Sure, you're not educated in the sense of having a degree, but I'd rather listen to someone like you than a professional. Well, thanks, Andrew. I really appreciate that. I don't talk about stuff much, but in this kind of forum, I guess I'm not ashamed of anything. I just mm -hmm. don't talk about it much, right. but I, I think that strength can be defined in two ways. One is the resilience and the fortitude to move forward when it's hard. Right. And, and the other one, and this goes back to the Gord Downey quote is to say that progress may not look the way I want it to right now. Right. And to, ha and to have the strength to allow perspective to come in and say, I'm always trying to put one foot in front of the other mm -hmm. every day. And some days that might be it. Hold that it thought, Bob. Yeah. Canadian Screen Award winning newscaster, oh Caroline Bargood from oh. Winnipeg. Canadian Screen Award winning uh, news broadcaster, Caroline Bargood says, hi, Bob Mackwitz Jr. Well, I love that. And she knows what a mess I am. So she knows this is all true. <laughs> she knows what you are. <laughs> Caroline's amazing. She, she's the when best. I, oh, she's the best. When I was the brokest in my career and I was doing radio, Carolyn and I lived together and we were so broke together. <laughs> it was so gnarly, but we kept each, we, right. we kept each other laughing. 
Now here's real talk from your world. So you lived on College Street in Toronto, and yeah. the place was a pit. It was an it abandoned was, doctor's office that still had old furniture on the side. It, it, like you had a futon frame on the floor for a bed, but no here's but no mattress. No, you slept on the frame. Uh, here's the thing, though, that made it so horrible is you're freaking snakes. Like the place was always 750 degrees Kelvin. Like. <laughs> It was, you went in there <laughs> and, and it smelled like the herpetologist's office. It was, it felt like that. It was so it felt, hot. Oh God, I was just so metal. I was just so, how Alice Cooper could I be is what I was going for. It was what I was going for, you, you know? You the rock lizard because you would sit there and just like, this was, was from the day I met you, all of your places were 30 to 40 degrees hotter than they should have been. I go to see you now in Los Angeles and I took a swim in your pool and it's like swimming in a soup. I heat my pool to 95 degrees because what's the point of having a pool? I don't own this place. I just rent it. It's stupid use of my money and I don't care. I'll live in my Airstream and it all goes away. But I wanted a pool that was really, you know how much I love pho. I love bowl of, I love pho. So I wanted to have a, I wanted to have a bowl of pho essentially as a swimming pool. So that's what I did. Okay, so your place where you lived with Caroline was yeah. basically like living inside of a bowl of fog. Yeah, it was. It was such a broken up place. Oh my God, we were so broke. We 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 had a futon frame, as you said. We only had a sheet. Uh, we weren't even having relations, but we had to we had to like stay close and cuddle. But we had a television from the garbage, Bob. And you know what was the best thing in the world? Because we, you know, when you would, I shouldn't admit this, but I'll deny it and tell everybody I was just doing it as a bit like rap lyrics. But what we did was we had one of those splitters where we took cable. She knows we took cable from another person's cable. So we had split cable and we were watching it. And Carolyn and I, all we were waiting for was the U.S. Memorial long long uh, weekend because it would be. Um, Law and Order marathons, and and Caroline and I would, and we were both like I was doing radio, she was working at a radio station. We were we were no one never had heard who we were at this point, and you know, we were we were just dying for a, uh, an American holiday just so we could watch Law and Order marathons on AE. <laughs> That's all we wanted to watch, man. We had the we had the, and in a way, it was kind of the time of our lives. In a way, it was the time of our lives. Of course, it was because striving is so much more interesting than preserving, but. Since we're talking about nostalgia here, it feels like, uh, if I can call an audible, I want to read a comment that came in from Mama Season, who yeah, said, yeah. Lately, it's really tripping me out to realize how huge an impact 1994 has had on my life. What? That's what they said, 1994? This was the thing? How huge an impact 1994 has had on my life. I mean, it just seemed like... This just seem like a good opportunity, Bob, to bring that graphic in right there. Or, Love that because graphic. Oh, last week we did 1994. We talked about 1994, right? Yeah. We try to do it every week where we just look at what was happening back in 1994. This really sprang out of a conversation at your dinner table where we were astounded when we actually did the, we did an audit of 1994 and all the things that came out, whether it was Pulp Fiction or Nirvana's Unplugged record. And it was just thing after thing after thing that, wasn't just interesting, but was good and lasted. So for today, and I don't know if you have this video that I sent you over, but I'm going to throw you out uh, a question right, for 1994. Right. You ready? Okay. Yeah. Who gave us the phrase, things that make you go, hmm. Things You're that make about, you go, hmm. Are you, are you talking about the, possibly the second most impactful late night talk show host in my life? George Strombolopoulos, he said with his gigantic waving finger. I am. In fact, I am talking about Arsenio Hall. Arsenio Hall is unbelievable. Do you want me to play a clip? We've got a clip. Do you want to play a clip? Play, play a clip and I'll, I'll explain why this is relevant this week. Have you ever looked at a tape like that and said, how did I do that? All the time. All really? the time. I mean, you, you know, I think the art of creativity is that you're always going to surprise yourself. You never know what's going to happen. It's just going to happen. And my game has a lot of creativity in it. You know, when I go out to play, I go out to play hard. Yeah. What happens, happens. You know, people see it and they, they get excited about it, and you know, that makes you feel good inside. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> yes. You know, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes when I'm talking to kids, I use you as an example. Sometimes kids will ask me, "How do you keep going? What gives you the determination uh, to know you can be the greatest?" And I use you as an example because you weren't in high school the guy they thought would be 
Michael Air Jordan, NBA MVP, you know? <laughs> no, uh, you know, for one time, uh, my principal advised me to go to an uh, Air Force Academy because he felt that after I finished college, I have a job. So I said, no, I don't want to go that route. So I decided to go to the University of North Carolina. A lot of people didn't expect me to do so well, but I guess that was a challenge that I face. And yeah. sometimes you have to face those challenges and see what happens. I remember that interview like it was yesterday, dude. Well, you loved that show, and it was four years ago, or uh, I should say it was uh, 30 years ago, uh, tomorrow. I don't know where it came up with four. Uh, it was actually because he was on for four seasons that Arsenio Hall announced that he was going to stop doing his talk show. And it wasn't because the ratings were in trouble. He just said, it's time. Tomorrow is the anniversary, the 30th anniversary of Arsenio saying he's, he's going to go off the air. That is correct. And I kind of mm. wanted to bring this up because it's not like that's, uh, you know, it's not like when Kurt passed. It's not that kind of a day that you mark on right. your calendar. But it actually was interesting to me because it wasn't that kind of a day considering how incredibly he influ influential he was at the time. And I wanted to ask you, because you've been a talk show host, but also in the day, yeah, you were a huge Arsenio fan. It was an enormous what, Arsenio what, what fan. You know, I, there's a couple things. Number one, I loved hip hop, as you know. Yeah. And even though I was more of a metal and punk and hair metal guy, I was more into that stuff. Uh, Public Enemy really got me into hip hop, right? And and Beastie Boys, of course. So hip hop was it was an important part of my life, and hip hop wasn't on television at all. So I could see artists on that show. The other thing was was that Joan Rivers. Remember when Joan Rivers was doing the show and she was leaving, and they had all these guest hosts. So they would bring in guest hosts left, right, and center. And I remember I see this really funny what your brain would remember even after all these concussions. I remember how every time Arsenio guested, he absolutely nailed it. And I was like, who is this fucking guy? Who is this guy? Right. I'd never heard of him. And cause I, what would he was pre-internet and all that. So uh, he also felt fresh. He felt young. He felt our age. Um, uh, as a kid who loved hockey, I also loved basketball and I loved Jordan and Jordan going on that show and being as comfortable as he looked like. I just think, and obviously it was just different. You know, it was very different. I, you know, I, here's the thing, Bob, when I was 18, because I had read that Neil Young did it, when I was 18, I drove from Toronto to Los Angeles. I had a staff meeting at the movie theater I was working at. I drove from Toronto to Los Angeles. And one of the things I did was go to a taping of Arsenio Hall. And, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and I, I went to it. And it's funny, it's only like three minutes away from where I am right now. And I went to a taping of the Arsenio Hall show, and Scotty Pippen was the guest. And it was the year that the Bulls were going to dethrone the Lakers and win the title here. You know, and I remember Arsenio, I still remember a joke in the, in the, in the monologue. He came out, he said, I went the other day to a KFC and James Worthy was there and they turned him away. He couldn't even buy a bucket. I still remember. <laughs> that I mean, that's a joke that I still remember from the Arsenio Hall show. The musical guest was Melissa Manchester. I just, you know what I also liked about it? And this is also really important because people are, as you know, are very racist. A lot of people. The reactions to Arsenio were so heavy at one point, were so heavy at one point that you knew that it wasn't just people didn't like the show. They didn't like that a black guy had a talk show at night and they didn't like a black guy who had a talk show that wasn't playing the game like he had couches. He didn't have a desk. We didn't have a desk on my show on purpose. And Arsenio was a really big impact. And you could tell that people just did not like that there was a black guy getting all this attention on this kind of show. And so I, I just naturally kind of. I just rejected that. And also, Arsenio was funny. He was funny. That's a really great answer. And you covered a lot. There, there, There's a lot in that. So let me jump in. First of all, you said it felt young and it felt different, which it was. Yeah. It was designed to be a younger alternative to things like The Tonight Show, which was, you yeah. know, pretty, yeah. pretty middle age and up. Uh, but more importantly, you said something you liked hip hop. And that really, I think, is the essence of why yeah. this matters now that yeah. Arsenio Hall and then also Keenan Ivory Wayans with yeah. In Living Color. Jeez. Ironic that both of them on Fox and Fox was playing identity politics back then to try and get its name out there. But what right. they correctly identified was that the subculture of North America has always had a hand in African American culture like cool is often defined by what's happening in that community and gay communities yep. subcultures yep. is where cool usually starts yep. totally. but with arsenio hall what was really interesting and he was a little ahead of his time 
but you could see that it was no longer subculture, that it was making its way into the mainstream and consuming. Like at the time, everything was still very much, you know, white rock artists, white, you know, white movie stars. And young kids weren't really seeing it that way in the same way that they always did. This probably didn't really manifest itself fully for another 10 years. And then today it just seems so obvious that hip hop, hip hop culture is mainstream culture. But what I love about Arsenio is he kind of, he was at the beginning of that wave and I don't think he gets credit for that. I really don't. Wasn't it Arsenio where Bill Clinton played the saxophone? That's the thing was, it was right. a place that was totally informal. Yeah. And, and it was countercultural that way. But you and I, you know, we love basketball and you think about the Michigan uh, basketball team, the Fab Five, and what was amazing about them was they were freshmen, mm -hmm. but people didn't like them because they wore baggy shorts. Yeah. And they wore baggy shorts on the court because they wore baggy shorts in the street. And that was the early 90s. So as we go back to this this year in 1994, or this week in 1994, yeah. uh, I just kind of wanted to point, you know, his band was called The Posse. He had a section in his his, his audience called The Dog Pound, and everyone yeah. went woof, woof, woof. And it was kind of, you know, it was funny. I was thinking about this because the, the sort of snooty TV watchers liked Letterman. Yeah. And then, and then like the suburban kids, you know, the working class kids, they preferred Arsenio Hall because he kind of spoke to them. It was almost like Blur and Oasis yeah. where you had like, you know, the sort of proper stuff and then the yeah, stuff yeah, that yeah. Re real people liked. And uh, when I met you, you were really into that. And uh, so I, I respected your opinion and it got me more into it. So, you know, the Arsenio faced a lot of pressure. I, I've never met Arsenio Hall. I don't know him, but uh, for sure, I was a, I was a really big fan of what he did. You know that Michael Jordan clip we played. I think speaks to what you talked about, which is, I mean, I've interviewed Michael Jordan when I was an NBA reporter in a scrum. You know, a microphone in a scrum. You ask a question, you get in. The first interview in my career ever that I did solo ever one on one was with Scottie Pippen. Weirdly enough, uh, when I was uh, when I was working at the Fan. I think you and I interviewed Jim Rose and Jennifer Finch from L7. That was when, that was a collective interview and Dave Bedini. But my first one on one, so I loved I loved it. But we I've seen sports reporters cover the NBA for a long time, especially in Canada. They were all baseball guys essentially that were assigned, uh, and some hockey guys assigned to it. And you could even feel the veiled racism and some of the stuff they were doing, and or at the very least a lack of understanding. But Michael on Arsenio, how comfortable Mike was, that kind of experience. That's a different thing altogether than what you would have got on the other talk shows where, where, where Michael was just kind of trotted out to be just Michael. And in a weird sort of way, it's a, an odd sort of corollary to Clinton playing sax in which like this was a, a space in which people could sort of be themselves in a mm -hmm. different way. Like it wasn't like the official, you know, you're out there yeah. selling stuff, you know, Johnny. Johnny Carson has tapped you. You're, you're, you're worth being yeah, on the yeah. show. Yeah, like, yeah. like, but by the way, um, MJ on, on, on Arsenio is peak nineties. It, it's oh just, God. it's, it's, it's just, and I wanted you to play that clip because also of your obsession with Jordan. So there you yeah. go. No, absolutely. There you, go. Um, you want to talk about cultures. I want to find a video that I want to play here for you that I think is, uh, pretty incredible. If I can find it, it's, um, it's about, somebody hearing a kind of music they wouldn't otherwise hear in the mayor's mainstream and how different it all was it there's one particular so you know i watch all these reaction videos and i love these reaction videos part of the reason part of the thing that makes reaction videos so popular is it's often hip-hop kids who would not listen to rock listen to old rock bands and they're blown away by Phil Collins' drums or they're blown away by the vocals in a particular track, right? But what but what happens is, and you know this, once something like that goes viral in a really explosive way, then the veracity of the virality is in question because now people are performing to try to get more clicks. And so they they oversell their reaction to a video. Wait, wait a minute. Are you trying to suggest that all those dancers on TikTok don't, absolutely love the songs they're dancing to i'm not saying all of them but i'm definitely saying maybe some, some? Of them. Yeah, some of them okay. for sure but but so there's this there's this there's this youtube channel um that played a song played acdc's highway to hell to a group of men 
tribal old men in the Sindh province of Pakistan, a place that I've been to, and they've never heard ACDC before. Many of these men are of great spirituality, great faith. They've never heard ACDC and they've never heard Highway to Hell. That, you know, you want to talk about introducing them to something they would never have come across otherwise. I just, I, so I, I just clipped a couple pieces together that I want to play for you and I want to get your reaction because I want to get Earth Day stuff, but this is just so good. Living easy, loving free, season ticket on a one-way ride. शैतान <laughs> दोस्त अच्छा बिन्नी ने कस्मर जी मानों के बुधाई से जुआ हाँ नहीं ना माँ ही जे को बचुंडे तो भाई कहीं रस्ते दे बनाने हुआ थी सके तो आना लासा ही उन्हें क्या क्या बक्शे भी चले जाते का खबर कहने यो तानी तो हाँ नहीं देखो नहीं जड़े इंजॉय इंजॉय जज्बो जो कोने सिस्टम है तो ये हो देखे तो तो बाबा ही तो पांच मरा मुद्दा मैंने खुश आ जाता ठीक का जो कोई अलामा लेकर हाँ ये केलो मरा डाडो जबरदस्त एक डो तरीके सा ये केलो तेज मरा दिशा में बाकी दिमाग जो भी I love that so much. I don't even know what to say. That was they were so right about so much stuff though. Life's journey yeah. is a vehicle that doesn't have a reverse gear. Yeah, I know. It's so great. It's so great. And and there was just you know as as Dajen says right there, patient thoughtful wisdom is such a fun thing to watch. And listen, you know Bob, you and I talked about this when we when we started going live on YouTube and Nathan who you can see and Tanya, but we you and I have done a we've made a lot of shows in our life. You know, you you know between off the record and and all the stuff you did at TSN and me and and me and uh and the stuff we did together on the talk show and Tanya and I on the talk show much music. We've made a lot of hours of television and one thing that we didn't want to do is do a thing that we've always done. And this isn't even that. We just wanted to hang out and give a place for thoughtful conversation to exist and we'll have a handful of people watching us when we go live we get thousands more watches when it's on demand afterwards and i just wanted a space where we could hear things like that that is just so effing cool i love that so much i feel like we'd sound like that if we were smarter <laughs> i watched well, that and i thought that's kind of like this we're distracted by life. Oh, what? Yes. But they're not. <laughs> no, no. I'm saying that guy said he's like, I leave everything up. I don't. I don't overthink oh. anything. Yeah, you know. <laughs> he's like, I don't do any of that stuff. We got to get the more songs. Yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. I love that when he's just like, he's. He, this is about going to heaven or going to hell. It's about going to hell. Oh, really? <laughs> just this moment. Uh, I've been, by the way, to that place. I've been to the Sin province, uh, where, where those guys are from. It's uh, in a, a part. And this is uh, when I was with the World Food Program. I am still am with the World Food Program. There was, a, n never mind the, the, the trouble that was happening there with the war, of course. This was back in, I think, 2009. Um, uh, with the World Food Program, there was gigantic floods. So that was me sitting there in one of the camps. Um, uh, and it was the journey there was pretty interesting, for sure, uh, on our way through it. And flooding had wiped out villages after villages uh and so many people lost their life 
Uh, and then I got to do this, as you know, my quest to ride motorcycles wherever I can around the world. Uh, you know, it's funny, that kid, that's in Sindh. I was in a, in with the United Nations in the World Food Program trucks, and they were really worried about something happening to me. So they wouldn't let me, they have a policy where they wouldn't let me be out there. I have to be in a vehicle that was armored. It was all this stuff. I get it and I'm grateful for it, but I didn't like that. So what I did was I, I pretended I had to go to the bathroom. I helped set up a camera. So I, I said to the shooter who was with this guy called John, hey, let's just set up and get a shot. So I got a shot and I, I got out of the truck and I walked away from the truck and the security and I saw this kid driving down the road with a motorcycle and I waved him down. Come here. So we had asked the support vehicles to go ahead. And he's like, yeah, he spoke English. I said, I'm, I'm just trying to get away from the UN. I want to ride a motorcycle here. You know, can I rent your bike off you? Can I, can I do something? And he said, no, 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 just hop on. You take it, I'll come with you, just like that. I went, oh, okay. So I just go for a boot down the road. And as we're approaching the the UN vehicles there, I could see Warwick Page, who's this amazing photographer who took those shots. Warwick is just kind of looking and he gets down and he snaps that photo of me, <laughs> me and this kid riding up. It's it's my favorite photo maybe of me ever. And that was in the Sin province where those men are from. That's a great photo. Can we see it one more time? This is the photo right here, yeah. Yeah, I love that photo. Who and took I like that this, one? Warwick Page is his name, and I like this one too. Just through this uh, rusted up car. Obviously, it was a different time. Uh, there was the you know the war was 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 happening with Afghanistan, and it was a uh, it was quite a thing. There was a lot of stuff going on. There was a lot of stuff going on. Bust a move, young MC. Yes. yes. I want to hear those guys talk about Bust a Move by Young MC. I've been oh, trying to think what what other songs could they do. I like the that one. And I, you know, I was thinking. I want to be sedated by the Ramones. I want to hear them dissect. I want to be sedated. Oh my God, that would be so cool. What that are some so other we, what are some other good ones? Well, I think Slayer would be too much. Oh, 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 oh. Ace of Spades by Motorhead. If you like to gamble, I tell you I'm your man. You win some, you lose some. It's all the same to me. Honestly, those guys could teach a graduate course on just that stanza. I love that. I love that. Um, all right. So how, how long have we been on the air now? We've been on the air for... Yeah, how long an have we been? An hour and 15 minutes, right? We've been on the air for an hour and is it Nathan, is that the right time? I don't remember exactly when we launched. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and a bunch of comments have rolled into, um, do, you, do you have time to answer a few right yeah, now? Do, yeah, do, do, do it. Yeah, yeah, do it. Tell us. Yeah. Well, someone, George, you've interviewed so many people and Dizzy Storms wants to know, who was your favorite guest to interview? I mean, I think it was, it was you, Nathan. It was you. It was uh, June it was Callwood. You right now. It was uh, it was June Callwood, probably, um, who's this amazing social activist uh, in Toronto. Um, started Casey House, first AIDS hospice in the Western world. There's a very uh, a famous photograph of Princess Diana holding the hands of a young man who was uh, was dying of AIDS and uh, AIDS related death. And they took her on a tour of that place. And I th as June t told me the story that when the tour was kind of over because they had put the guys, the boys who were the healthiest up front. And she said, where are the ones who are really sick? And she's like, well, they're back here. And Princess Diana went back and held one of these man, men's hand, if I remember correctly. And that photo went around because remember back in those days, people weren't, there was a lot of fear and a lot of misinformation about HIV, a lot of lack of understanding about it, of course. Um, and that th June call would created a space for that to happen. So, she, and I interviewed her a few months before she passed away. No, sorry, a few days before she passed away. And she knew she was going to pass away. She was terminally ill and she wanted to have one more conversation uh, about life and what was coming. So that was my favorite one. And, and you know, to the clip we just played, of, mm -hmm. um, those men's reaction to ACDC, it's actually really about, and with the comment we put up here, it's about wisdom. And one of the heartbreaking things, first of all, losing somebody like June was just all that accumulated knowledge is gone all that accumulated knowledge so that was a really really good one that was a really i love that one you know michael j fox is a philosopher he's kind of the full package honestly he's incredible to interview as well those two are a couple of my favorites but personally the first time i got to interview rage against the machine or first time i got to interview robert plant or jimmy page like that was you know for a zeppelin kid that was quite a big deal yeah and the wu-tang clan and the rizzo well, going back to your roots, um, Sean Savage is wondering if you have any thoughts on Law and Order Toronto. 
You trying to get me canceled here, Nathan? Trying to get me canceled, Nathan? I've seen one episode. Okay. Yeah. It's a little, it's a glossy Toronto that I don't recognize, but I've only watched one episode, but I watched it and I will watch more and I want it to do well because it's, because I'm one of those Toronto kids that never goes to the island. And there, there's a lot of the first episodes from the Toronto Island have a very unpopular point of view about the island. So um, the so the first island one and the dude who sounds like a Toronto guy that I grew up with. So it really. But so so I'm I, I didn't. It's the first episode. I need to give it time. I need to give it time. I want it to do well. I want it to do well. So I've only seen one episode. Okay, Nathan, I haven't seen Paul, have you seen Paul? Yeah. 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 George? George? Yeah. That was the most BS answer I've heard you give in so I, long. I've seen one episode. Like, I can't make like, a judgment on one wait, episode. Wait a minute. Wait. Okay. So what do you think of that one episode? It was fine. Are you using a definition of fine that somehow involves sucks? No, no, because it doesn't suck. It doesn't suck. I don't love a lot of the more modern uh, Law and Orders, to be honest with you. And it's sort of, it's it, because the, the thing I love so much about Law and Order uh, at its core is that Law and Order is just about case. And they built it to educate people about the law in case because they understood that we have to win and lose. And so, but of course, the era has turned into be a little bit glossier. So it's just not as much case as I want. So, what, but the reason why my criticism may not be accurate, but or may not be appropriate, Bob, is because it's based on what I want it to be, rather than what they want it to be. Remember you know? in the Simpsons when Kang and Kodos are running for president, uh -huh. and Koto says, "We'll move backwards, not forwards, upwards." Yeah. Downwards and forever twirling, twirling. <laughs> you like Kodos right now. You're just twirling. I want, because I don't think I, after one episode and not really paying attention that I'm, I'm in the right, I, I, I should pass a judgment on it. You That's want it to work. You want it I to really work. I want it to work. I really want it to work. There's something about George. it, but I don't know, but that, but, but there's something, I feel that way about a lot of network television. I feel the way about a lot of network television, if I'm being honest, right? So, but it just might be that network television is working for other people and I'm not part of that club anymore. And that's fine. I know we got another question here, but don't you hate it when you watch a show and you like it at first and then it starts to taper off and you're trying to convince yourself you still like it because you're four or five episodes in and you're thinking, I've invested this time. If I can just get to number 10, maybe it'll get good again. I'm feeling that way right now about three body problem. I really yeah, like it to start. Yeah. And now I'm feeling like, I don't know if I'm... Yeah. I, feel that way a little bit. I want it to be good. I'm on season two of Will Trent right now, and I'm like, what are we doing here, guys? And uh, but three body problem I liked. You're right. At first, I liked it because I thought, well, no one's making shows like this, right? Exactly. Right. I start. Have you seen Fallout yet? No, but I heard it's really good. Yeah, it's, it's strange, Nathan. Have you seen it? No, I haven't. It's it's it it's really strange. Um, I want to do Greenland stuff, but do you have any questions? Do we have any other questions coming in? Well, I also just wanted to say, Andrew, thank you for being with us because he commented, I feel like the universe wants me to be here right now. And somehow Andrew ended up here. So thank you, Andrew, for being here. And thank you, everyone else for being here. I love it. I love that you're here. I love that you're here, Andrew. Delta Blue says that, uh, they think Fallout is great. Um, again, it's just, you know, Bob and I have this show on Apple Music. It goes on every day. Um, and... We play lots of songs. We have lots of guests and it's great. It's fun to do. Um, but I'm only on for an hour a day. And Bob and I, we, when we started the show, we were three hours, right? I think an hour a day is more than enough, by the way. But it's, it's about the other things we want to talk about. And we've talked about this at great length. There's this epidemic of loneliness going on out there. People feel broken. We don't have the solutions to a lot of stuff. But what we can do is create a space where you just hang out a little bit, keep yourself company, share some with your friends. Again, like I'm, I'm a pretty swaggery, confident guy. I know that this show, this thing that we're doing is going to get bigger and bigger. But I'm, I like these early days of this thing. I like how weird it is. And I haven't had nearly, because like I'm running all this weird technical stuff here. I haven't had nearly as many mistakes this week as we did the first week or the second week. So I kind of like the experience of learning how to do this. Forwards, not backwards. Upwards, not downwards. Twirling, twirling. Yeah, that's a good point. George, you're, you George, you're, no, I'm saying you're twirling towards success. You're what twirling. What are you talking about? What, what was your issue with that statement right there? Nothing. I was proud of you. You haven't made that many technical errors. Look, it's Bobby Panther. That's you got it Bobby. on the wrong. You got it on the wrong person. But hold on, I'm gonna put this right. 
Oh, oh, by the way, since we're talking yeah. about lower thirds, just so I don't forget, and I know we want to get to the Greenland stuff in just yeah. a second. But, yeah. Uh, for Andrew, who said the universe wants you to be here, I wanted to share two quotes with you because we were talking okay. about strength and weakness and health and wellness earlier. Yeah, you want to share those quotes now? Is that what you want to do? Yeah. I okay. tried to distill what I believe about life into two different quotes, and right. uh, this is what I came up with. So that's my grandfather, Fred, no longer with us, but in his mangled English, he used to say, keep and go, which was just his way of saying, just stay in the game, stay in the game, something good will happen. And then the next one, let's see if you can figure out who this is. Okay. So I remember your grandfather, the Jeej would say that. I'm going uh, to get that tattooed on my forearm, actually. Keep and go. You should. You should. It's the best. Don't plant your, don't plant your bad days. They grow. I'm going to give you some, I'm going to give you some clues. All right. All right. It's a singer, musician. Yeah. Uh, you really love him. In fact, sometimes you call him dad, especially at 10 o'clock. What album did he put that on? I'm blanking. You're talking about Tom Waits. Who is it? Is Tom Waits. Tom it Waits. is Tom Waits. It Don't is. Plant your bad days, they grow. It's, actually, it's, it's from the live movie, Big Time. Oh my God. I haven't seen that in so long. And he's talking to the crowd and he just says, Don't plant your bad days. They grow. He's not and, wrong. Even, and even as like a 19 year old kid watching that, I was thinking, Yeah, it's pretty good advice. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely it is. Absolutely yeah. it is. But speaking of twirling, when I told Bob, I'm like, you know, I need to, you know, my brain is doing this. I got to do that. I think I'm going to start meditating. Do you remember what you said to me? Nope. You said, don't. You'll lose your <laughs> edge. You said, don't meditate. You'll lose your edge. Your edge is who you are. And you don't want to, you know, and that, in my brain, that's planting bad days. That's what you're telling me to do. Did I really say that? You said it to me on the front steps of my house in Toronto. And I remember uh, my friend looked at me and goes, when, when you left, he said, that is really bad advice. That is really bad advice. You should meditate. By, by the way, it's great advice. <laughs> because you will lose your edge. I, I'm actually sort of blown away that I told you the truth. Yeah, you told me the truth. You said, don't, don't do any meditation. It will be bad for you because you will lose your edge and you do not want to lose your edge which by the way is exactly what would be perfect to get you to like subscribe share and watch another video because that's the kind of that's the kind of good advice we can bring you here on our, yeah, kind of, our little hangout every night I, I kind of feel like a lot of the stuff we talked about probably doesn't have the same gravitas anymore coming from me considering that i advised you to try to be unhappy because uh, you'll be more successful. It was good for business. It was good for business. All right, I want to talk about, uh, um, I want to get to this thing because Earth Day is coming. What is Earth Day? Is it on Monday? Is Earth Day on Monday? It's on, it's on Monday. It's 22nd. Earth Day is on Monday. Um, Earth Day goes back to 1970. Do you know, I, I believe a large a large part of why Earth Day was started as this official thing was there was a Santa Barbara oil spill in 1969. And that was what helped you know, to create this momentum to create uh, the very first Earth Day. And of course, it's been going on ever since then. Observed around the world, all kinds of events happening all over the world, people doing all kinds of things. Um, and, and and our relationship with the environment is fraught with political differences. And, you know, and I'm sure Nathan will come back to you after this because there'll be all kinds of comments that'll pop in um, when we start talking about Earth Day and, uh, and, and the environment and things like that. It's so there's all these things that have been happening around the world because of Earth Day, and it's getting harder and harder to reach people because of misinformation and disinformation. And of course, science changes and things learn and people learn and everybody expects you to be perfect. And then there's the fight over plastic straws and nobody knows what to do about that. And there's all this kind of thing that goes on. But it's very, very, very clear uh, that we have some big problems. In fact, I want to pull up some stuff for you. The plastics, I think that they're speculating that the uh, plastic use is or production is going to double by the year 2050. And by 2060, the waste is going to nearly triple. We're going to have nearly the amount of triple, which is, by the way, that in and of itself is the problem, is having all this waste. If you've been anywhere around the world, you've seen the, the footage or you've been there yourself and you've seen how much plastic and, and, and ends up washing up on shores, uh, usually in places that are impoverished, impoverished. And that's why the fight in the climate emergency is it has a social component to it, has a race component to it as well. That's one of the big challenges. But waste aside, more and more now, more and more sciences are linking a lot of health problems to not just the 
plastic production, but the harmful chemicals that make them. So we're talking about cancers that are connected to it, obesity connected to it, um, heart issues connected to it. This is a significant moment. And I know, I know, I know how easy it is to let great be the enemy of good. I know how easy it is to have, well, you, but what about this? Well, what about that? And then there's jet shaming and then there's this, but why this and why that? I, I just, I just want to reiterate, and again, I'm not here to tell you how to live your life, but the one thing that I do think is really important to say, and one of the reasons why we talk about this is know who the enemy is. The, the enemy isn't the group of people who are trying to change behaviors to make the world more sustainable. You may not like how they do it. They may be imperfect. In parts, they may even be annoying, <laughs> but don't, that's not the enemy. The ones who want to make sure we keep getting sick and they sell progress and all this other stuff to our faces. Oh, industry will sort out the climate. All that will happen. Well, that's a challenge. That's a challenge. And as you know, this is happening all around the world. The climate fight, it knows no borders. We've covered it for many, many years in my career. Uh, one of the things that I got to do uh, in my life was go to Greenland. Uh, Greenland was epic. Liam Colgan is a Canadian climate scientist uh, who was working uh, in Denmark, who invited me to head up there and see it firsthand. There are only two ice sheets in the world. And there have been two reports, I think in this year alone, two studies that came out in Nature magazine that talk about the impact of climate crisis on the ice sheets, one in Antarctica, one in Greenland. And we're talking about a melt at an enormous rate, so dramatic that not only will sea level rise, but the time is changing because Greenland is losing its gravity. It's, or it's, it's kind of, the, 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 the dimension of the kind of gravity, kind of gravity that it has, like it's weakening. It's weakening. So there's all this stuff that's going on. And that's why we want to keep marking our day. And I know that people are going to get all up and I don't care. I still think it's important that we do this kind of stuff. So what I want to do now is take you to Greenland with me. We went there and got to see firsthand of some pretty incredible stuff that took place with Liam uh, and Anders. And uh, it's just, watch this here. At the beginning of every disaster movie, it starts with people ignoring scientists. <laughs> I, we laugh when we oh, see God. that. Yeah. I wonder if you laugh when you see that. I stopped participating in like some future projection climate assessment stuff. It just is super bleak. Like you go to these workshops yeah. and you're like, let's put out a new projection for the future. And then like at the bar that evening, like everybody's just like totally depressed and <laughs> nobody wants to. Like you invite a friend who wasn't at the workshop. They're like, what is wrong with you people? Right. And you're like, oh, we're just looking at climate projections for the day. And Well, this is it. There's a lot of hopelessness around it. I think it's easy to feel hopeless. I mean, it's such a big problem that you it, it just invites you to feel hopeless at the individual level. No doubt you've heard about Greenland in the climate change conversation. Mostly it's because of the melting ice sheet and that's impact on global sea level rises. And if you were to come here, you would see lots of markers of the destructive forces that we have unleashed with climate change. So I wanna show you something, crevasses. Crevasses are these big, compelling canyons that have opened up in the ice. And yes, they are beautiful to look at, but here's the thing, scientists say, they think these canyons have opened up in the last 20 years, and they're opening up more than 100 kilometers into the ice sheet. That is a scary headline because it talks about the ice sheet's response to climate change. It's one thing to hear about them, one thing to read about them. I want you to see them. Come with me as we go to the ice sheet. As far away as Greenland might be from you, what's happening here is crucial to your life when it comes to climate change. The ice sheet is in trouble. You hear a lot about it, but what's actually happening? There are only two ice sheets in the world, in the Antarctic and Greenland. The ice sheet contains more than 95% of the fresh water on Earth, and scientists have been keeping an eye out and sounding the warning bell. I have been summoned by not only Greenland's incredible landscapes, but by this fella right here, Canadian scientist Liam Colgan. Hey, how are you? Welcome to Lumasat. Great to be 
here. Hey, buddy. Good to see you, man. Liam works for the Geological Survey of Denmark and Greenland, and he wanted to show me what was happening. So three hours on the ground, two and a half hours of flying, probably. The far one is mm -hmm. here. I see. Yeah. Last time I checked in on these crevasses, there were three open crevasses. But the field keeps getting bigger, so I'm guessing we might see more than three open crevasses this time. We just don't know. This is just perfect weather. Thanks. We're going to one of the most beautiful places on the planet. It's going to be a hell of an adventure. Come on! Good morning from Oskarin Kyoto Golf Tango. The crevasse field we're going to today was not there 30 or 40 years ago. We're not entirely sure why it's forming, but it definitely says things are changing. But that's sort of a goal is to figure out why the crevasses are forming and what it might mean about the stability of the ice sheet. Why here? This is where the game is being played. What happens in Greenland will affect the world. The pole went down a little farther than it should have on that last one. Oh, well, there's uh, something that's very deep at that spot there. There's a level of change happening here that is very concerning. Crevasses that weren't there a couple of decades ago, and they're big, and there's a bunch of them. It's another place where you're getting a sign that something is wrong. It's another marker. From the air, you can see the beauty and the mystery in the deep scars that are the crevasses. They are a feature of ice sheets, but how deep they go, that's the guessing game. And they are an indication of something that is changing. What does it mean for the health of the ice sheet? One of the reasons they might be forming is if the ice sheet is sort of accelerating and sliding faster in the ocean and stretching itself out, and that can sort of be the inland limit of that acceleration. So it's tearing it. Yeah, yeah, the crevasses happen when the ice is flowing more than the ice can deform, and so it fractures. In order to track the ice sheet's rate of fracture, Liam drills down and installs large poles for GPS. With that, he'll be able to see how far they have moved and the ice sheet's acceleration over a longer period of time. And they evaluate the rate at which the crevasses are produced, and the ice sheet is deteriorating. All right, last pole of the day. There you go, that's the ice. <laughs> now, before we head back to Ilulisat, Liam and I stop here at the ice sheet's margin to see another indication of rapid climate change. So we can see rock here, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right there is ice. We're standing in something called the trim line which is the newly exposed bedrock. So just a hundred years ago, the ice sheet margin would have actually been more than 10 kilometers west of us. And in the last century, it's retreated back, of course, accelerating in its rate uh, up into the present margin there. So all around us, we're in the newly exposed rock. When you're a climate scientist and you spend more time thinking climate, talking climate, researching climate, uh, looking at the scenarios and what the future projects. I mean, those crystal balls that are the, the global climate models. I think then the cognitive dissidence starts to break down and that's what you can get. You get way more invested and you can even get so caught up in it to the point of like climate grief where you, you just feel so big and overwhelming. So you're here studying this, you've been here for a while and you know that getting the word out about climate change has been mm -hmm. hyper politicized. Mm -hmm. Uh, you're fighting this enormous, not just a misinformation campaign, but a disinformation campaign. How do you talk to people about climate when you know there are so many climate deniers out there? It's tough. Most people will acknowledge that climate change is happening, mm -hmm. and then the sticking point is whether or not we need to take action. Like the outright denial is a pretty hard position to take. There's very few people actually try to take it now. We have the Paris Agreement, which is nice in principle, but in practice, it's not screwing down our emissions uh, the way we, we need it to. I do take some comfort and some hope in things like litigate to mitigate with activist shareholders sort of... Expecting more from their companies. Expecting more from their companies and, you know, really holding them to account that they can't count on fossil fuel reserves in the ground as a bankable asset, for example. I also take some comfort and hope in things like divestment campaigns, um, consumer activism. So, you know, I see a lot of good grassroots potential, bottom up, 
which I think will really complement the top-down Paris Agreement stuff. I travel all around the world trying to raise awareness yep. for this kind of stuff, but I travel all around the world in planes. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, then, and that's something that gets thrown back at me, quite rightly. It is a challenge that we are climate scientists, but we use helicopters and high carbon activities to do our climate science. And it can be tough to justify that and rationalize that. So when it comes to flying, jet shaming is huge. And climate scientists, it's pretty easy to get haters being like, ah, you flew to that workshop and you wear plastic something or other. You're, you're a petro baby. Yeah. <laughs> and like, you do get those. You do get those. Is that a thing, petro baby? I just made that up. It's but a like, thing now. <laughs> But I have to live in a world where I feel like we can still do all of our activities, but to hopefully be moving towards a smarter and more climate friendly way of doing those activities guided by some of the research we're doing. But I think it's fine to be critical and ask questions about if we're using the carbon footprint the best way possible, where are there alternatives and where can we decarbonize? The other thing I hear is that human innovation will figure it out. When you look at the paths forward, generally there's some sort of like techno savvy, low emissions pathway. Think of it as a Star Trek world where we all cooperate, we all share resources and yeah, we innovate our way out of it. And then on the other hand, we have a Mad Max type world where if we don't share resources, we don't cooperate, we just fight over everything. There is no common solution and the world just gets warmer and societies just start to uh, go at each other. Look, there's no question that climate change is affecting our world. And this visit to Greenland uh, helps to give me a first-hand perspective. And right now, Greenland's ice sheet is on average currently losing about 9,000 tons of ice per second, day in, day out, throughout the year. Greenland's ice alone is responsible for 17% of all global sea level rise. And for those still unsure about climate change and want to get into a debate about it, think about this. You can't negotiate the melting point of ice or the general physics of the greenhouse effect. Opinions aren't really the key there. The key is understanding the science. Greenland and her big sister Antarctica are poised to reshape our coastlines, whether we like it or not. We need to pay attention to them before it's too late. I got to tell you, that trip was one for the ages uh, for me. It's something that I've wanted to do my whole life is to go to Greenland. I never thought I'd have the opportunity to do that. Um, uh, Anders Drood on camera, who traveled with us. Um, Adam Predkill was the pilot of the helicopter, who was incredible. And William Liam Colgan, the, uh, the scientist that we went with. And we got to, you know, you saw we were up there on the ice sheet digging into the ice, planting poles to measure snowfall and see how this whole thing comes together. It was uh, really amazing. And, I, and and while in Greenland, of course, got to do a bunch of different things, not just that. But one of the things about a place like Greenland and anybody who is not white and who is of in, uh, any kind of indigenous to any part of the world knows this, that oftentimes indigenous people don't get to tell their own story in any way, shape or form. Or, and, and for the longest amount of time, it was told by explorers or by scientists, whatever that stuff. We didn't want to do just that. So when we went to Greenland, uh, we caught up with perhaps the most recognizable Greenlander, uh, somebody called Q. Q started a social media set of social media pages where she was just telling daily stories about Greenland and getting us connected to Greenland history and Greenland culture. It's such an important place in the world for climate. It's, and more than that, it's such an important place. And oftentimes that story has been told by the people who are controlling it, as I mentioned. So when we got a chance to talk to Q, we, we wanted to share this with you. I've been traveling a lot around the world and realized that people don't know anything about Greenland. I'm so proud of being a Greenlander and I just want to show it and tell the true story of Greenland. But what's so interesting is that in the last 10 years with social media, these stories would normally have been told by somebody not from here yeah. on a travel mm -hmm. expedition. Mm -hmm. I am the first Greenlander actually telling this true story of Greenland from, the, yeah. from a Greenlandic perspective to the rest of the world. We still uh, rely on the plug fund from Denmark. It would be great if we could get our mo more income so we can become more independent and eventually completely independent in the future. So many people who are following me from around the world um, are also indigenous and the indigenous experience is different in so many places. Mm -hmm. We are 
been a lot colonized back in the 50s, 60s from, from Denmark. And there's also some dark sides of it, which we don't talk much about. We see how people who have powerful voices media can really change yeah. conversation. I suddenly have a huge responsibility, I feel, and, and I need to be careful of what I'm saying because it can have a huge effect. The pressure of watching your words. Yeah. How do you navigate that? <laughs> Oh, I just, I it just follow my feeling. Follow Q's Greenland online. She is uh, absolutely amazing, and the stories of Greenland from her Bobby are just, it's, it's uh, as you can imagine, it is such a beautiful place to be. What really jumps out from the video is the purity of the color, mm -hmm. that the snow is like just glistening white and you mean the, not, not like slushy oil and gas queen no. street with the 501 street car wrecking everything the exactly. electric yeah. and the sky is so incredibly pristine blue that you just get a sense of like if we had nature the way it was supposed to be mm -hmm. it would be vibrant like this all the time uh it just looked like god it must have been amazing breathing that air and having fresh air it was kind of weird actually to to be to have things feel so clean yeah. I'll, I'll tell you something as a guy who is a plant-based eater as a vegan we the only stuff i could eat really was there's only a couple little places to eat out uh, there where we were um pad thai so i had a lot of pad thai it was everything. but yeah it was very uh, listen we want to we'll post something maybe the next day or two tanya we should talk tanya tanya by the way doesn't want to come on camera we i've asked her to be on camera she doesn't want to do it for obvious reasons she's but, smart well, yeah, because that's the obvious reason. But the remember when Donald Trump was talking about wanting to buy Greenland, and mm -hmm. the, it wasn't as like sure it was crazy, but it had been. There have been lots of conversations about a version of that, not buying it from, but because of northern security, right, and Arctic sovereignty and things like that. So it wasn't, but. The concept of ownership of land in Greenland is very different. You can't own land. You can't own land. I don't want to give it too much away here because we'll post, let's post a video maybe tomorrow or in the next little while we'll post it on, on social media. I told a little story about owning land uh, in Greenland. It was pretty incredible. Okay, let's get to the real business here. Wait, hold uh, on. Do you mean that? Do you mean, wait, do you mean that? Or, or do you mean that, Bob? Which, which, which one of the real business do you mean? That one? Honestly, you look like the... Uh, a, a guy with a boat, and he's like, Get I got back. Bring that back. It, That's insane. Like, well, he said, I have a drone. So he said, awesome. Let's, let's, let's get some drone footage. Cause how dope would it be kayaking? And, and by the way, this is the ice field from which the iceberg that they say sank the Titanic came from. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm out here, but <laughs> we're about, I don't know, like two seconds out there. He loses the drone somewhere in an iceberg. So Your ordinary points of reference are all gone. Mm -hmm. You must be thinking God exists when you're out there. I don't want to be twirly, Bob, and work around a subject, as you've said earlier. <laughs> <laughs> you always you know get so I upset when I burn you. No, no, no. No, you know what I thought? You burn me all the time. I couldn't possibly have enough fuel to get upset about that. No, which I don't mind. No, you know what? I Here's what I thought. Um, you know, obviously I was raised in a religious home. And so it took a long time for me to kind of get a lot of that stuff out of my system. And I did work really hard to get it out of my system and it still pops up from time to time. But what I thought was how precious every little second of this existence is that, that think of all the things that have had to have the trillions upon whatever amount of things that have to happen for this planet to be created and for for me to be here and us to be star and then as i'm thinking this peaceful stuff and i'm getting cl too close to the iceberg which i didn't really think about 
um, there's this enormous cracking sound. And it was so loud, it, it w like a million gunshots going off or lightning. And then all of the things I had learned came back into my head. Why, why do they call it the tip of the iceberg, Bob? Because so much of the icebergs underneath the surface and that icebergs, I didn't realize this, by the way, that they're not, they're not all very stable. So they flip and then if it flips, I'm dead. I'm, I'm shot into the air. So what I normally do in that situation, I'm getting that close and I'm in this really Zen moment of how beautiful this is and what a gift it is to be alive and blah, blah, blah. Um, I hear this crack and all I do is go, whoa. And I look over at our Greenlander, our Greenlandic indigenous men, who's our the captain of boat. And to see, it's like a flight attendant. If the flight attendant's cool, the wings are not coming off. I looked at him and he got scared. He jumped and he went like this. And then I thought, Oh shit. <laughs> I just try to paddle back to the boat to get as far away from it as I could. So that's my my pristine moment was gone in an instant when the crack of the iceberg happened. We've all been in a plane that has turbulence and you just pray to see that drink cart. Because you know if they're still selling <laughs> drinks, you're probably gonna be okay. <laughs> no, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh man, so that's an work. amazing experience. Uh you know, you said something really beautiful there that uh just it it kind of touched you deep inside about the value of life. And I think one of the problems the environmental movement has mm -hmm. is that so much of the world is urbanized mm -hmm. that you don't you lose a sense of the sublime. And the way that the romantics talked about the sublime, mm -hmm. it was so closely related to nature because there mm -hmm. is an instinctive born in us or not, I don't know, but it seems mm -hmm. to be across all cultures is that there's something about the wild that brings out the spiritual in us. And it's very hard to think big and think uh, progressively on that level unless you can tap into the spiritual like you did i'm not saying necessarily that you have to yeah. have a religious experience but what you had was a very profound spiritual experience about life and that's just it's really freaking hard to do when you live in a 30-story condo to have a sense of the immensity of life i mean you get really good at understanding how good people are at building stuff you know, whether it's antibiotics or, or, or subway systems, like mm -hmm. we're, we're amazing at that, but and it doesn't, really, and it doesn't have, have to get away all, from it. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be an all or none game. This is the thing that I was, and I didn't know this growing up, by the way, you know, I, I was such a Toronto boy, so city, even when I lived yeah. in the suburbs, like Malton and Rexdale, the outside, even, you know, it's, I was just so wired for a city it's one of the reasons why i love la we joked about it the other day how catastrophic this place is in so many respects and in new york in the east like i'm a city guy but i used to go camping as a kid and my relationship with the outdoors is legit and i'm gonna go in the next few days hopefully out on a motorcycle camping excursion to get in the woods because nothing nothing is as good for me is being out there. And we would be sitting there, Tanya, producer, was with me in Greenland. I remember like, you go sit on that deck by the hotel we were staying in, I'd crack a non-alcoholic beer and just have a non-alcoholic beer and watch the sunset essentially over the ice sheet. And I thought, I don't place a lot of value in the human experience. I place a lot of value in the biosphere's experience of which I'm a, a minuscule part of. And to watch the icebergs flow. Oh God, it was just so beautiful. It was just so beautiful. By the way, Liam, uh, I texted Liam, I WhatsApped him and told him, we're gonna play this clip on the show today. You gotta come on the next few weeks to talk to us about what's next. And we're already working on the next project. So um, well, I'm sure you've got lots of questions you wanna ask him as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, geez, mostly just like, how's the pad tie? How's the pad tie? That's all I could eat there. That's all I could eat. I think we should probably, I mean, Nathan's back on. What time is it now, Nathan? We've been on for an hour and 52 minutes. We, we The sweet spot is between 90 and two and a half hours. But when Bob and I are going, it's a lot longer than that. So we should probably, uh, there's so many other things we could do. But people have been good. Oh, by the way, here, let me show you this one picture. Let me show you this. Here is the crew. There, there's when we were in Copenhagen. There's Liam, William in the in the tan jacket, Anders the camera operator with the ever cool, handsome look and the glasses on his uh, shirt. And there's Tanya making a funny face hiding in the background. Uh, so there's our little crew in Copenhagen when we had our first meeting where they told me that it was going to be a bit potentially gnarly up there. And as you know, Bob, I don't have a lot of fears, but something I've never, ever, ever wanted to do and I've avoided it is a helicopter. And I agreed to do this trip. And then they told me I had to take a helicopter under the ice sheet 
and that, that kept me up. So I was uh, I was grateful to get to do it just for that photo alone. By the way, <laughs> it, was, it was kind of adorable to see you afraid of something because you yeah, really don't you don't express fear about stuff very often. But I knew you meant it because it came up a couple times. Yeah, because dude, I had too much rock and roll. Randy Rose, all the musicians I love. I, it's, it's like helicopters. They you know they freak me out. Nathan, before we sign out, um, any what any comments? Oh, we got forest therapy popping up by the way, um, which is a nice comment here about being in the thing. Karina says, do a traveling show. We miss Anthony Bourdain. Shows it an underlying message in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. Well, I would do Karina, that. In a heartbeat. As it so happens, Karina, we happen to have a pretty good one locked and ready to go, which we have to make. We do actually have a really good idea All right. for a show. All right. Nathan, what's the good word? Well, Maria E.V. sends her love in the form of three purple hearts. Thank okay. You, purple. Um, Ali says, thank you for sharing and getting more of this message out there. Jassy, I guess apart from the pad thai, Jassy wants to know if you had any uh, other favorite food in Greenland, maybe like from from Greenland, like that was native there. Did you get to try any of the dishes? No, because it was, all, you know, it was all Canadian, huh? yeah, I, mm. but, but no, I mean, actually they, there was this one place we stayed that made an amazing vegan dish that it was really great that I had it for sure. And it was, it was mushroom based. So mushrooms, but I will say this, that when I went to Pangner Tongue in, in, um, in none of it many years ago, when I worked at much music before I was plant-based eater, um, I was, I'm so glad by the way, I was eating meat back then because we had, I was able to eat raw caribou that had just been hunted by an Inuk uh, hunter. We, we were on, we had dog sleds and snowmobiles. We were out there and he had draped uh, a caribou over this, this wood frame to dry out. And he handed me a, 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 a jackknife to cut off a piece of the, and I idiot from the city thought it would be like beef jerky. I thought, oh, it's like a, like a jerky. I love beef jerky. It was freshly killed. It was just explosion of blood. It was so raw, um, and, my, and I ate it. But I got to eat whale and seal uh, at the time. Uh, of course, hunted by Inuk uh, hunters and fishers. So uh, I have experienced it, but not this time. Not this mm -hmm. time. Um, uh, oh, by the way, Luann's got another comment that makes me laugh because it's something that you don't see me wear too often, except when I was the turtleneck, uh, the turtleneck that I was wearing uh, in that photograph right there. <laughs> I would only wear my turtleneck when I wanted to honor, uh, honor the great Hab Thomas Placanitz. Um, can, can, can you put that back up, please? Oh, wait, that picture. Uh, let me see. Yeah, that one right there. Yep. You look like an LL Bean model. It's a Wuxley hat. They make uh, they make parkas are Canadian. I do look a little bit like that. You know what? I'm okay with that. Is LL Bean a cool brand? Do we know them? Or, or we're, probably people are mad at LL Bean for something. I'm sure. Did we, um, is there like, are well, if, if they are, you were not, it was not with the intention of saying that you represent any negative values that they may represent. Yeah, that's I right. I did not know. I I did it was not just know. like it, Eddie Bauer doesn't exist anymore. I don't think. Yeah. No, no, I don't even know. Actually. I don't even know. Uh, Bob, what's coming up on our radio show, by the way, do we know? I know, I know today we had fun. Uh, we have to go and do another one tomorrow. We did. Yeah. Well, well, Tomorrow's going to be a deep dive into Tool because it's Maynard's 60th birthday. Maynard's 60th. Wow. He turns 60 tomorrow. So it's going to be the, what we like to do is the musical universe of. So it's the yeah. influences, it's the bands inspired by, it's people they've worked with, plus lots of music from Tool and a perfect were you, circle. Were you at my house um, the day that Maynard came in, in Toronto? Nope. I was Maynard. not. I would have loved that, though. He's very neat. We did a Strombo show many, many years ago. I went to Maynard's house when he was living in L.A., uh, and he was he showed me all the new Pussifer stuff. It was early, early days of Pussifer, uh, and he played me some stuff, and it was really, really cool. So he returned the favor and came to the house when we were doing the Strombo show for CBC. And he's like, yeah, I'll come in. I'll do an interview. So he showed up, and there was a moment where I just I, – he was standing by the black wall upstairs in my home, and I thought, oh, I just got to take this picture. So I grabbed a photo, uh, a camera. I think we had a Polaroid. And I took this picture. This is Maynard just hanging out at the house uh, in Toronto, which was so wild. He looks like demonic Paul Schaefer. Oh, yeah. He kind of does look like that. You're right. He was so cool. He was so cool. I, I'd interviewed Maynard a bunch. I interviewed Maynard at Much Music back in the day on Tool and Perfect Circle. Then we took this photograph. Like, look at me then. Holy shit. Living good. That's what it. did your shirt say? Drink Iggy. Drink Iggy Pop for twenty five uh, cents. I bought it at this uh, punk rock store in the East Village. Funny. Look at my beard, dude. 
Bob, yeah. that may not this may not come as a surprise to you, but that was just after I got fired from Hockey Night in Canada about a year later, and I was uh, I did I was living in Topanga in L.A. I'd put on thirty pounds. My beard was crazy, and oh, I remember some guy some guy commenting me. I mean, he goes, "Cut your hair, shave your beard, get back on television." It was like an intervention on Twitter. <laughs> this guy had made with me. You were doing potato chip therapy. I was definitely doing potato chip therapy. It was really good. Right. So, someone mentioned someone mentioned forest bathing. You were doing uh, Dorito bathing. I, I think I was doing that. Uh, by the way, Black Lab 27 says that um, no way Maynard looks 60. That's true. He looks really great. Um, okay, we're going to go. Nathan, anything else? I was going to say one more thing. Yeah, Dahlia Garcia says, we, um, in response to the Greenland video, we need to connect with the environment. We live in a hyper-reality, and this makes us feel alien to these real problems. I think that's totally true. You know, we, we don't pay attention to the things we don't understand. And I think the concept of the human brain is not wired to really understand the, the scale of what's happening. And so I think that's a big part of it. Bob? George, if I can go to the words of the great philosopher of our time, Mick Mars. You can. Guitar, gu guitarist of Motley Crue. Bass player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, guitarist, yeah. People guitarist. don't, people fear what they can't understand, and Motley Crue is the most misunderstand band in the world. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Hey, dude, before we go, um, you yes, texted me today, before we go, you texted me today and you said, Get me a picture of Fred Durst in a white T-shirt, which is yeah. a text I've never received in my life. And I don't yeah, understand. Probably won't again. Right. So I got you one. Why did you want to do that? Well, because I wanted to, when we were talking about Arsenio, I wanted to talk about the evolution of the white T-shirt and how like Fred Durst's white T-shirt is a little hip hop, but it's also sort of like angry Jacksonville, Florida. And then by the time you get to Eminem, and did you get Eminem? Like that white T-shirt means something completely different, even though they represent the same cohort. Mm -hmm. Like they, they represent the same constituents in a lot of ways. That's some amazing thing. But by by the time you get to Eminem, hip hop yeah. culture has become so pervasive that the idea of being a common person, a working man, a just kind of average person, like they all loved hip hop. Oh yeah, like that, that migration had happened. And then the white T-shirt previously, like Bruce Springsteen. All right was tied back to rockabilly and that was tied to the mechanics and stuff so in a weird sort of way i wanted to make the point about arsenio being the beginning of that process where people had just adopted hip-hop on, on a different level there's a whole article written about the baggy t-shirt and hip-hop and what it meant oh, is, what is happens right? though yeah what happens culturally though when the white t-shirt meets when eminem and fred dirt meet for the first time look at all the white t-shirts behind em Look at all that. <laughs> <laughs> the honor uh, of Slim Shady is behind him. No, a lot of Slim Shady's right there. A lot of Slim Shady's right there. My father worked in uh, the States for five years. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, how's it going? And he said, half the people here want to sleep with Britney Spears and the other half want to sleep with Jennifer Lopez. In the States. That's what they said. And that's what that picture was right there. That's, <laughs> that's what that was. That's what it is. I love it. I love it. Luann wants the kilometer thermometer. Do you have stories for the kilometer thermometer? I can do a quick Connor McDavid, uh, 100 hold assists. On hold on, hold on. There you go, Bob. There you go. It's just the best. Yeah. It's just the best. Uh, oh, what's, Connor what's McDavid, 100 point? assists. Congratulations to him. Only or Lemieux and Gretzky have done it before him. Uh, speaking of Edmonton, very quickly, you were a little part of that story. You were a witness to history. You were on the stage when he was drafted by Edmonton. How did I he look? He looked. I was, I was hosting Hockey Night in Canada the night that the draft lottery happened. We were doing the draft lottery, and Connor was in the green room, and it was in the same building that the CBC is, of course. So we were doing, uh, we, we had them just assigned not too far from where, you know, I'd done the show for all those years. And I, he never said this to me, but I was certain, he was young, right? I was certain that they had, they thought in their mind that Buffalo was going to get the pick. And then he had started to put in his head, you know what, Buffalo probably, because Edmonton had their shots on like, Buffalo's close to home. I, I, in my mind, I, I got the sense that they thought Buffalo. And when Edmonton got the pick, I went right to the back room to get him to bring him on. And he looked and his face was red. And I went, how are you feeling? He goes, it's crazy. 
it's a crazy day. And he comes back out and we did the first moment. And then you're right. The night of the draft, I was in Florida. I think it was the last draft I did possibly. I was in Florida and, and he got drafted and I got to interview him. It was really, he's such a good guy. Connor's such a good guy. Uh, such a good kid. I'm really happy that he's turned into all these, all these guys. Um, and you know, Edmonton, Edmonton had the worst start to the season and here they are in the playoffs in a meaningful way right now. And because we're the CBC, we can do two Alberta stories in a row. Uh, do you, do you have, the the, yes. <laughs> do, you, do you have the blockbuster still? Oh God. I don't even know if I have that. Let me see if I found that. That's still here for you. So yeah. something called free blockbuster. Mm-hmm. Somebody, these are all over the States and people put videos in them like vhs and you can come and take one and replace it you see this with books all the time there's actually an instagram feed ten thousand followers and Mm -hmm. edmonton just got their first one so it's now in canada they're expanding they're going international free free blockbuster Uh, listen um i don't you know this j cole you know whack diss track thing that was going on and then all of a sudden that diss track against Kendrick got taken off streaming, which I yeah. think, as you know, I am profoundly against the ability to do that, right? Like you put it up there. This blockbuster thing is more important than than ever now because people will just take away movies and songs at random if they want to. So if you want to be able to, you need people with physical libraries. I, I love streaming. I stream all the time. We do a show on Apple. We love the streaming. But there's got to be an option as well for that. And uh, I'm going to end with just a tiny rant, and we'll see how it all turns out. Someone mentioned earlier they were mad at the Liberal Party. They just uh, yeah. announced a big pre-election budget, which is always yeah. a big spending budget traditionally. Yeah. And it's going to be about $38 billion. Uh, a chunk of that's going to go into housing. Right. And when asked, of course, where's the money going to come from, they said, well, we're going to tax the 1% and the you know corporations. Mm-hmm. Right. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. Well, you know, what's interesting is yes. that tax day in the U.S., Mark Cuban got somebody called out Ian Miller said, Hey Mark, just wondering if you, your corporations pay more than required taxes in order to pay for your share. And he said, I pay what I owe tomorrow. I will transfer to the IRS $288 million. This country has done so much for me. I'm proud to pay my taxes every single year. Tag a former president that you know, doesn't, (laughs) you know, he got elected Trump did partially because he said, yeah, it's crooked and I'm crooked and I take advantage of it. That's how I know it's crooked. And uh, you're right. And while Hillary was busy saying, no, 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 it's not crooked at all. I just want to share this stat and then we'll move on. Okay. So 65 years ago, people and corporations contributed about equal amounts of income tax to the Canadian government. So business Mm -hmm. and then private citizens, about the same amount overall. And in 2015, 16, which was the last time the most recent statistics are available, Canadians paid 145 billion in income tax while corporations paid 41. So they used to be almost equal, and now it's about three times more on the uh, onus of the private citizen. And here's what I was going to say, and here's my little rant, is I think all of us want efficiency. All of us want our tax dollars to be spe- spent well. We hate it when they're not, and we should be mad when they're not. Mm-hmm. But what we should be even madder about, and the part that embarrasses us, is when the average person is expected to carry the freight and the idea that the richer you get the less you have to pay is insane and you know just don't embarrass me don't embarrass me that i'm paying my taxes if you're like i I had this one guy and i'm not going to say where he is somewhere in my wife's family but a really powerful accountant very smart guy and you just uh, totally nailed it by the way (laughs) how many how many smart accountants were in your wife's family okay fair fair enough okay but i but i'm going to tell the anecdote anyway because it was a family and he pulled me aside and he said you know i talked to the government you know i actually can't tell this story i'm gonna have to bail on this Stuff on here. I don't want to cause rift in your family. I you know what, want to cause- let me just let me just say this. I saw a little bit about how the sausage was made, and it's uh, yeah. Oh my god. god! God bless you, Mark Cuban. Let's leave with that. Absolutely. Um, thanks for hanging out with us today. Really appreciate it. Uh, it's just nice to be able to spend this time with you again. It's really early days. We're just messing around. It, it, and it's it's having these kinds of conversations. It's the kinds of conversations that Bob and I have anyway. 
uh, on the phone all the time and with Tanya and Nathan. So we just thought, why don't we put it online and create a little space? We've gotten much bigger response than I, we kind of thought, all of us thought we were going to get off the top. We're going to keep doing it when it works. Um, and it's really, it's really, really good. And Bob, I think I know what our next thing should be like the Kurt Cobain thing. We should tell more stories about songs that we want the the guys in the Sindh province of Pakistan to listen to. We should build that's around actually, that. That's actually a really great idea. Can you throw up the like, uh, subscribe, comment, and all that stuff? Uh, there we go. Uh, let us know what you want us to talk about. Oh, like wait, who, you, Bob, who you want to hear a, from. That's a different, That that's the... Cat phone, all right? And, uh, Jeez, and you can, can you put that back up? <laughs> yeah, hold on a second. <laughs> what the hell are you doing in that picture i'm talking to a, on a phone which is a cat and um my friend their, their their neighbor had they had a stray cat that had all these kittens so i wanted to go visit the cats and i said here take a picture of me pretending a cat is a phone because i never know when i'll need that that was two years ago <laughs> so it, i've never needed to use it until right now so it made perfect sense and plus it ties into our conversation earlier with the trap king who is uh is using his strength and his vulnerability to uh to to help kitty cats across, or around the country and the world uh you played the long game on that bit and it paid off for you by the way i don't know if anyone can see this mm -hmm. but on my board behind me you probably can't see it and i can't unplug far enough but written right at the top are the words be strong and this is not like a bro culture kind of uh be buff or be productive mm -hmm. it's a reminder that whatever you do in life try to do it with resilience and discipline and sincerity and if you think of strength as jet fuel for virtue then strength becomes not something to fear but something to cultivate that's what i mean for myself by be strong is don't be afraid to be virtuous i love it holler at us please um, thanks for being with us. Thanks, Bobby, Nathan, Tanya. It was a lot of fun. We could keep going. In the old days, Bob and I would do a show until we ran out of steam. We could keep going all night, but we're not gonna. I, I'm gonna eat my Indian food, which is waiting for me on the uh, on the table. And uh, I love it. We'll talk tomorrow, Bobby. Yep, I'm gonna go get some pad thai. Oh, go get it. Yeah, bye bye.